the mother of all talk shows is back. Unleashed, unabridged, uncensored, and unbelievable. Only on Sputnik Radio. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. If you didn't get the chance to tune in to the mother of all talk shows last week, here's what you missed. No more happy birthday for poor children everywhere who don't know where their next meal is coming from. It's a grotesquely unfair and unjust world. That is for sure. But, you know, the question was, even back then, this is a carbon copy of a Cold War model. How much of that infiltration was infiltration by the Soviets and how much was actually the uh, British state trying to undermine the labor movement itself? So the parallels to today are frankly striking. There was a queue of army officers wanting to talk to me. And do you know what they overwhelmingly said? And they, were not, they also had the courage to say so, that I had been right about the Iraq war. Is that your experience too? George, I absolutely agree with you um, to the core of my being. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. This is London, but broadcasting to you across the whole of the world. On FM in Washington, D.C., on AM from coast to coast, from sea to shining sea in the United States of America. Throughout the world, online on sputniknews.com and on RTUK's Facebook page. You can watch as well as listen to the show, as you can do on my own YouTube channel, George Galloway Official. All over the world, students and some teachers are drawing in their chairs for the next three hours of the Open University of the Airwaves, now gone global. The College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees and where you're encouraged to speak back to the teacher. Three hours of the mother of all talk shows. What's not to love? The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The world is our classroom and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Well, in the last uh, week since I last spoke to you, the British state broadcaster, the BBC, has fallen from the gutter into the sewer. Their so-called flagship panorama was doubled in length and halved in integrity, actually spending what last vestiges of integrity and reputation that the BBC had. The state broadcaster, on behalf of the state, launched a 60-minute prime-time assault on Her Majesty's loyal opposition, the people who are supposed to oppose the government. The BBC, which is supposed to report impartially between the two of them, and indeed across the political spectrum, instead lent itself to the sweepings of the Israeli embassy floor, to the zealots of the pro-Israel lobby in Britain, in an unhinged, unrelenting, 60-minute, unbalanced assault on the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, and the General Secretary of the Labour Party, Jenny Formby, herself undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer. It was unremitting. It felt like an hour and a half rather than just an hour. And no voice, not a single voice, was heard to the contrary of the thesis, the narrative of the former Rupert Murdoch tabloid son journalist John Ware's agenda. An agenda I have been familiar with for very many years. But even I didn't expect 
the bosses at the BBC to allow a program like that, so full of holes, so full of falsehoods, to go out onto the air. The first hint was when faces, melancholy faces and mournful voices were on the screen in front of us, telling us of the horrors of life as a Jewish member of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Within a minute, I wondered, what's that person's name? Why aren't they telling us that person's name? And within hours of the show, we knew why. Because the unnamed, mournful, melancholy, apparently normal members of the Labour Party had mostly already been seen to sharp-eyed television viewers on Al Jazeera's epic program, The Lobby, where the very same people were filmed undercover and a very different face they put forward undercover, not knowing they were being filmed too. The people that we were being asked to accept as normal, ordinary, bona fide, just your everyday boy and girl next door who had been subjected to, on the face of it, horrific racist abuse because they were Jewish, all turned out to be either people who were filmed undercover by Al Jazeera in the lobby or worked for, worked for, for pay, the Israeli embassy in London or worked for, for pay, for years, one or other of the Britain-Israel organizations, the equivalents of APAC in the United States. Now, all of those people have a right to speak on television. I wouldn't have minded hearing from them at all. But when you put them on television and don't tell us who they are, who they work for, well, at the very least, you are utterly distorting the narrative that you are placing before the viewer. And I believe there will be severe consequences of that. As a humorous aside, uh, there was a young man who claimed that in a meeting in Liverpool, the great city, the great port city of Liverpool, that at a meeting in which he was conducting an investigation, he'd been asked by one of the Labour members there if he was from Israel. On the face of it, a very damning accusation indeed. Except the members concerned had tape recorded the entire episode, the entire encounter. And it turned out he was asked, admittedly in thick Liverpudlian scouse accent, which branch are you from? Which branch of the Labour Party are you from? became broadcast to the world. Are you from Israel? It's a falsehood. It's proven on tape to be a falsehood. And together with the other, and there are many, many more, more than I've got time to adumbrate right now, holes in BBC's panorama, I fully expect that flagship to be dispatched to the wreckers' yard. If not now, then after the next general election. Because here's the rub I say to international listeners, not only did the state pay Panorama to launch an attack on the official opposition in the state, but anybody with a television in Britain is forced on pain of imprisonment of also paying the BBC a so-called license fee, which is a regressive poll tax which requires every person in the country with a TV to pay the BBC or go to jail for not doing so. They never thought of that in North Korea. Even Stalin never thought of that one in the former Soviet Union. So we'll be taking calls on that, I'm perfectly sure, because the airwaves and the Twitter sphere and the internet has been filled in Britain with little else since Wednesday when the show aired. 
Up until Wednesday, though, there was a different story. I called it Ambassador Gate. One of Tony Blair's political appointees into the higher reaches of the diplomatic service was a man called Sir Kim Darach. He was picked by Tony Blair precisely because he was not an old school ambassador. No Sean Connery, no David Niven, no Ray Milland, no white handkerchief in the top pocket, no monocle, no class, just a brute political activism together with a very, very foul mouth. The kind of foul mouth that he deployed everywhere that he worked. Sir Kim Darroch is entitled to write anything he likes as Britain's ambassador in Washington about Donald Trump and his administration. As a matter of fact, not many people would gainsay what it was that he did write. But if you're going to write to London from the embassy in Washington, a string of vulgar ad hominem abuse, well, you better make sure it doesn't appear on the front page of the Sunday newspapers. And that is precisely what he or his department or his embassy or whomsoever leaked the matter did not ensure. And it did appear on the front page of the Sunday newspapers, at which point precisely his position in Washington became untenable. Even before Trump called him a pompous, foolish, stupid man, even before Trump turned his Twitter guns on him, he was done for, a dead duck, because no ambassador, especially in a posting as important as the capital of the most powerful and important country in the world can survive the sunlight of the Sunday newspaper presentation of the ambassador's innermost thoughts about his hosts. And the invitations instantly drew up. Uh, Trump said that he would not work with the ambassador again. Boris Johnson declined to give the dreaded vote of confidence to Sir Kim Darach and his goose was cooked his place on the airplane back to England where he'll be amply rewarded, I have no doubt. It will be a rise, Lord Kim Darach, sitting for the rest of his life in the British Parliament, I have no doubt, and very soon. So don't feel sorry for him, he's landed on his feet. But here's the interesting twist. In between last Sunday's revelations, stolen emails plastered across the front page, Scotland Yard, the British police, asked all newspapers not to publish any further stolen email material from Sir Kim Darach's account. The newspaper rightly replied, publish and be damned. We have this material. We don't care if it's stolen. We care only that it's true and that it's in the public interest that we publish it. Well done them. Hats off to the mail on Sunday for their courage, for their holding of the torch of liberty and freedom of speech and freedom to publish that which is true and which is in the public's interest. Even more amazingly, all of the British political class from the two rivals for the Prime Ministership of Britain, right across the political spectrum, all the political leaders damned the police for their sinister, draconian, dictatorial request and defending the right of any publisher to publish that which they felt they should. Julian Assange, anyone? Julian Assange is in the dungeon 
at Belmarsh Prison for doing precisely what the mail on Sunday has just been effusively praised by the whole of the journalistic galère and the whole of the leadership of the British political class for doing. I'm not a lawyer, but if I was, I'd be writing all this down because I can think of no more powerful a defense of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and no more powerful argument against his being deported to the United States injustice system and cast forever into the gulag. In between times, we were nearly at war in the Persian Gulf. The British Royal Marines, of whom I was once almost one, stormed, as the newspapers put it. It's a bit of an exaggeration. They climbed on board an unarmed oil tanker, an Iranian oil tanker, with 2.1 million barrels of perfectly legally exported crude oil on board. There are no sanctions against Iranian crude oil exports, at least not in Britain or the European Union. John Bolton and Donald Trump can do what they like, say what they like, but they don't govern us, not yet, at least. And as this tanker was going lawfully about its business, sailing in the Mediterranean off the rock of Gibraltar, it was boarded by British Royal Marines. The captain and the first officer, both Indian citizens, imagine, are now under arrest on the rock of Gibraltar. And the cargo remains stolen by the British government. Now, the British government say, well, there were sanctions against Syria. And we believe the boat was bound for Syria. But they don't know that the boat was bound for Syria. And number two, there are no sanctions on the import of crude oil into Syria. Only against the import of aviation fuel. And so, without any shadow of a doubt, this vessel was illegally boarded, its cargo illegally impounded, its senior officers illegally arrested. And they wonder why Iran is hot under the collar about it. That begs a bigger question. Now that we're leaving, 27 other European Union states in very, very bad order, with our reputation amongst them really rather poor, and with many great battles with them still to come, why did we pick a fight with Spain by committing this act of piracy in what the Spanish consider Spanish territorial waters? Number two, now that we're leaving the European Union, shouldn't we be trying to make friends around the rest of the world? So far, we're practically at war with Russia. We're practically at war with Iran. We are definitely at war with Syria. We are in a state of pre-economic war with China, against which we have been meddling in Hong Kong, and we've just fallen out with the United States of America. I mean, is this collective madness that has descended upon our small island? There was another big story in the week, a fellow called Epstein. Many British listeners and viewers perhaps haven't heard of him, but they soon will not least because of his friendship with some minor members, not that minor actually, of the British royal family. Not least because Lord Peter Manderson appears ten times in his little black book. 
Not least because Tony Blair has flown often enough at Mr. Epstein's expense to where I'm not yet altogether clear. But much more seriously for Mr. Epstein and his powerful friends who include the Clinton family par excellence. This man now stands accused of horrific sex crimes against children. Doesn't get much more serious than that. So serious that the United States Secretary for Labor, Alex Acosta, has just had to resign from President Trump's cabinet because of a sweetheart plea bargain he did with Epstein, which allowed this convicted pedophile and sex offender to serve just 25 weeks in an executive wing of an open prison where he lounged to his heart's delight. Now, that sweetheart plea bargain has been set aside, and the scene is set for the mother of all criminal trials, federal criminal trials, and all kinds of politicians from both sides of the Atlantic seem absolutely certain to be dragged into it. All that and the future in minutes. It's the mother of all talk shows, all right. The telephone number that you can call should be on a ticker tape running along below me now, but just in case, it's 0207 798 2255. Obviously, for international callers, you put 44 in front of that and drop the first zero. You can also Skype me at GG Motes. That's G G M O A T. Yes. You can listen online, as I say, at SputnikNews.com. You can watch online at George Galloway official YouTube channel or on RT UK News Facebook page. If you want to ask Adam, the cleverest man in England, a question or two, get your tweets in now. Hashtag Ask Adam. Hashtag Motes, M-O-A-T-S. I'm George Galloway. You're listening and watching to the mother of all talk shows. Twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week, we give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in Tuesdays to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for Women in Society with Professor Hannah Dickinson, where we talk about the major issues, challenges, and struggles facing women in all aspects of society. Hannah Dickinson, professor and organizer with the Geneva Women's Assembly, joins the show this Tuesday and every Tuesday on Loud and Clear. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money-related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at SputnikNews.com. Now, our first guest this evening is the Honorable former Ambassador to Uzbekistan, the Honorable Craig Murray, the most famous, certainly the most noble Dandonian still operating in the political and diplomatic field today. A Dandonian is someone from the city of Dundee, as I am myself. Who knew both Craig Murray and me from our East Coast industrial town. But 
Craig has now moved on. He's organizing a music festival, so he's in the middle of a field. So we're just getting the line exactly right and out of earshot of the music. So while we're waiting for him, let me give you some of the written material that's already flooding in. On Facebook and YouTube, N. Lamont says, was torn watching Panorama. I thought there was some outrageous anti-Semitism cases brought to the surface which were not dealt with accordingly. Saying that, it felt very biased and contrived. And Print Me Up says, now Panorama, let's have 60 minutes of investigation of Islamophobia in the Conservative government and party, please. And Duruti, 1936, says, Corbyn continually rolls over and surrenders to the Blairites and other right-wing careerist MPs who will never cease their backstabbing and plots to oust him. One day, it will be too late. And Hella, 1981, says they're creating theatrics and trying to draw our attention away from the bimbo snaking his way into number 10. That's uh, Boris Johnson, I think, as he's likely uh, next week to be the Prime Minister of Britain. He's likely, I predict, to beat his challenger, uh, Jeremy Hunt, I said, uh, by a two-thirds majority. That's my prediction. Uh, on Twitter, Fiery Squirrel says that Panorama programme was awful and full of mistruths, very disappointing. Well, it wasn't disappointing to me, for I had no illusions about the BBC and about Panorama in the first place, but I get your point. Jody Thomas says this is where it's at. For a factual, unedited breakdown of the past week's politics by the master orator, George Galloway. Guests are a collective of cutting-edge masters of their subjects. So for intellectual conversations and discussion, it's moats. Plus, if you disagree, have your say. And Cow 1986 says, are you anti-Tom Watson because of his stance against Brexit or his stance against anti-Semitism? Hope both the anti-Semites and Ramoners. And Betty Ann 32 says, Tom Watson hasn't followed the wishes of his constituents' referendum vote. That in itself should mean he'll lose his seat. Well, full disclosure, I may well be standing against him as an independent Brexit candidate at the next general election. 68% of the people of his constituency voted Brexit, and Tom Watson has been the leading wrecker of Brexit on the British political scene. And Jania, J-A-N-E-A, says, me too, mate. I'm just thinking how dapper GG looks tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Let's take the first call of the evening. It's Ian in Middlesex. Ian, welcome. Hello, George. Good to speak to you. Nice, clear line. Go ahead. Good. I'll keep it brief because I know you've got other callers. I was at the demonstration, the Free Assange demonstration, opposite the uh, Media Freedom Conference at the print works at Canada Water. <laughs> there was a couple of dozen of us there. Good for and you. on the second day, we were joined by Justice for Jamal, some Saudi dissidents, so that was about 30 of us there. Um, we, uh, we think this is really, really important. It concerns anybody who can push up a coffin lid, because... It's the dawn of tyranny. If they get away, what well, they're getting away with. And it was surreal that we were out there demonstrating and they were supposedly discussing media freedom. There was limousines going in and out and it looked like a mafia convention, not a freedom <laughs> of um, media convention at all. Well, it kind of was a mafia convention. The countries uh, that were not allowed in, uh, as you probably know, Ian, but not everyone will, were Russia... Venezuela, Syria, and North Korea. They were all banned from a conference on media freedom. You couldn't really make that up. Saudi Arabia was there because, of course, that's a bastion of media freedom. Mm. Unless you're Jamal Khashoggi, in which case they'll cut you into pieces and throw you in a bath of acid. You really couldn't make it up. So, Mafia Convention... Uh, is pretty much what it was because these people care nothing about media freedom not even in their own countries they are rigging the media markets 
precisely to exclude media freedom and banning RT, for example. I mean, is RT such a danger to them, such a challenge to them, that we have to be locked out, that we have to be traduced, that we have to be insulted, that we have to be sanctioned by the British state and its regulator, and now excluded by the British government? Is RT really such a threat to them? Well, if it is, I for one am very glad to hear it. What about you, Ian? Good for RT. If it wasn't for RT, I wouldn't have known about the demonstration or the whole surreal event banning real people, real voices for freedom outside. Exactly. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for RT, you wouldn't know about the yellow vests now in their 35th or 36th consecutive week of mass protests throughout France. There's nothing on the French media, nothing on the British media, even though we're but 28 miles away from France, uh, where we sit here now in England. If it wasn't for RT, you'd know nothing about Julian Assange and the great service to humanity that he has done. If it wasn't for RT, you'd know virtually nothing about the war in Yemen. If it wasn't for RT, I could go on, believe me. Well, that is media freedom, let's face it. Exactly so. Ian, how are you watching this, just as a matter of interest? Uh, I'm watching it on my laptop, uh, okay. and I'm speaking to you on the phone. I'm going to let you go now, George, because I know there's loads of people who want Thank to speak you. to you. Thank you very much, Ian. Excellent. Andrea is in West Lothian in Scotland. Go ahead, Andrea. Hi, George. I was actually just phoning up to ask you on your opinion as to why the, the American government and the British government are allowed to, to do what they're doing to Julian Assange, given in, given in the hand what's happening at the moment. Well, um, they've not got their way yet, Andrea, because it still uh, has to go through all levels of the British judiciary first, and then I expect it will be in the European Court of Human Rights. So they're not guaranteed to get their hands on Julian, not least because the disproportionality of the punishment that they have in mind is so uh -huh. grotesque that it will require Julian to be in a dungeon for the rest of his life. 17 counts with 10 years maximum sentence on every count. Now, even if you don't think, even if you don't think that newspapers uh, should publish stolen material, you'd have to admit, Andrea, that that's uh -huh. a grossly disproportionate punishment. And so oh, definitely. I'm not sure they will get their hands on them. But that, that short answer to your first point is uh, these people who call themselves the international community, who call uh -huh. themselves uh, rules-based societies, are just sick hypocrites. Oh, they, definitely, definitely. They, they care I mean, nothing it's... about rules. They bombed Yugoslavia without rules. They invaded Iraq without rules. They destroyed Libya without rules. They attacked Syria without rules. They are uh, threatening to uh, imprison Assange forever without rules. They do I mean, it what, because they what, can. What, what, how, how are they actually treating? I mean, the, the thing about I, I, I'm a human being, so I mean, I feel for the guy. How are they treating him? This is the thing. I mean, well, very badly. You've seen, you've seen, him, you've seen him getting dragged out the embassy. Yeah, yeah. And now he's and in exactly. Belmarsh. Now he's in Belmarsh, uh, rubbing shoulders with uh, child killers, uh, with terrorists that cut people's heads off, with the very worst of British criminals, this it, it, butterfly. It didn't, look in a, it didn't look in a good state when he came no. out the embassy anyway, when they dragged him out the embassy. I mean, that was the, that was the British police. Yeah. So that, that'll just give us a rough idea of what we're dealing with. The exactly. It's a butterfly being crushed on a wheel. Andrea, thanks That's for the call. Yeah. Got to take a break right now. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us. From mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication 
of prisons to the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful uh, water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video and I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. His Excellency Craig Murray, uh, the Honorable Craig Murray, former British ambassador to Uzbekistan, and of course, for many years, a pillar of the Foreign Office itself, is on the line, a slightly dodgy line, Craig, uh, at a music festival. I'll ask you about the music festival in a minute. But first of all, uh, are you crying many tears of sympathy uh, for your former colleague, Sir Kim Darach? even though he's almost certainly on his way to the House of Lords? Mm, yeah, and not only to the House of Lords, I'm willing to uh, take a bet of any sum that within two years he's on the board of a, a banker or an armaments company or an oil company. So uh, I, 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 I don't think we need to worry too much about the future of, uh, of poor Sir Kim. Now, I said at the beginning he's entitled to his views about Donald Trump. Indeed, that's what we pay him for. Uh, he's entitled to uh, convey them to London. But if you're going to color your views as colorfully as he did, you have to make sure they don't end up on the front page of the mass circulation Sunday newspapers. Whose fault do you think it is that that's precisely where they ended up? Um, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to find out. And um, I mean, I don't blame him for his use of language particularly. I, I, I should say his views were, were rather mundane. Pe people may be surprised that we're paying someone very large six-figure sums for uh, an analysis which you could read any day in the New York Times. Um, but uh, I, I don't especially blame him for the color of his language, but it's very interesting to know who, who leaked them and why. Well, the police are on that case now. Uh, and uh, it seems they're determined enough to get to the bottom uh, of this. That'll be fluttering the pigeons in the dove court, won't it? Uh, it will. And I mean, it's quite interesting because these are Foreign Office telegrams. And if you print one off or if you take an electronic copy, um, of course, they are sophisticated. Even when I was in the Foreign Office, uh, which is a few years ago now, they were already sophisticated enough so that be it a paper copy or an electronic copy, there are, there are marks not visible uh, to the person printing it or, or copying it, which show who did that, who was the person with access, uh, you know, whose copy it was. Um, so I'd be quite surprised uh, if they weren't able to trace the source reasonably quickly, because this particular category you know, of diplomatic telegram uh, is not easy at all to, uh, to, to leak, leak without being discovered. Now, uh, the uh, thing that I highlighted earlier uh, about the hypocrisy of the situation is that the Mail on Sunday have returned to the fray with actually rather less mundane and really quite uh, damning emails from the same stolen batch. Now, the police uh, appealed to newspaper editors in the week that people should not be publishing stolen material uh, from this batch. And the newspaper, to its credit, 
uh, thundered back that they would publish and be damned. And they have been congratulated for so doing by virtually all of the political class in the country. And I'm asking myself, why is that admirable when it's done by the Mail on Sunday, but imprisonable when it's done by WikiLeaks and Julian Assange? No, of course, that is uh, precisely the correct question. This is you know, monumental hypocrisy on the part of the political class in, in protecting their own. It's also the fact, of course, you know, that a genuine whistleblower who wishes to leak information uh, so that it reaches the public who are entitled to it, it should give their leaks to WikiLeaks or publish them themselves online. So we see everything without the gatekeeper of a politically agendered newspaper choosing which snippets they choose to leak to us and what they intend to hold back, because we, we don't really know. None of us is in a position to know the genuine content and tenor and context of these, uh, when all we know is such little bits as the mail on Sunday choose to tell us. Now, one of the things they told us today, uh, I think we'd, uh, we'd uh, all agree on, uh, most people listening to this, watching this anyway, and that is the wholly unnecessary nature of the current standoff with Iran. What did you make of that part of today's leak? No, I think that's, um, that's absolutely right. And, and the fact that the, uh, you know, the reason that the Trump administration was so against the, the Iran nuclear deal was simply the fact that it was the Obama administration that had, had agreed. I think that's also, that's also true. Of course, we, at the moment, we're, we're seeing a genuinely dangerous build-up of forces in the Gulf, and this terrific saber rattling where, where the Americans are going on about the need to protect freedom of navigation, and at the same time, hypocritically, we have quite illegally <laughs> intercepted you know, an Iranian ship lawfully going about its business in, in, in Gibraltar. So uh, it, there are layers and layers of hypocrisy in, in, in the attitude to Iran here. Too many to count in the time that we have. Let me ask you finally, if I may. Mm -hmm. Uh, about the panorama uh, this week. I've never been a great fan of Mr. John Ware for reasons I will adumbrate later. Uh, but I, uh, I, I do remember the day when panorama was really something and when the BBC was really something. Uh, it was a tawdry uh, second, third rate affair, wasn't it? The panorama attacking Labour this week. Absolutely sickening, uh, with no attempt at balance whatsoever. And they can say they invited Jeremy Corbyn to appear, and he didn't. And of course, it, it would be beneath the dignity of a party leader to to appear and 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 argue such baseless smears. But it simply is not true that there are not many, many intelligent and articulate people they could have invited to put the opposite view if they had any interest whatsoever. In, in fairness or, or, or balance, but plainly they didn't. It, it was purely a matter of agenda that, that you know, hid as much as it, as it told. And uh, no, I, I, the BBC has plumbed depths of disgrace, which are really quite astonishing now. Yes, uh, they must be counting on the, the Conservatives being re-elected, uh, I would have thought, because uh, they, have, uh, they have fashioned a rod for their own back by lending themselves to what was effectively a state uh, operation against the official opposition. I think that's true. I mean, I think the state is extremely confident. It, it can prevent Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister. And, and I think uh, that's partly based on you know, the same miscalculation that May made when she called an early general election, which was that the, the ability to mislead and misrepresent will last forever. Whereas, of course, once you actually have an election in process, uh, and by law, Jeremy Corbyn is allowed uh, a fair access to the airwaves and to be seen directly by voters, uh, people uh, very quickly see another side of the story. Uh, and, and I think the, the fantastic amount that the polls changed during that period when broadcasting has to be rather more fair is something we're going to see repeated again. Yeah, for, for international viewers and listeners, Corbyn came back from apparently the dead, which was the reason why Mrs. May called an election. 
to 40 percent of the poll uh, lifting Labour's share by a greater amount than any election since 1945. Uh, he could do it again as a minority uh, premier at least, couldn't he? I, I think that's very possible. I, I really do. But I mean, British politics are, are such a complete mess at the moment. Uh, and you know, we're, we're going to have the most divisive figure in British politics, you know, foisted upon us as prime minister. It, it really is almost impossible to, to, to say what happens in the next six months. Well, he's going to be the prime minister in a few days, chosen uh, by, let's say, he gets a decent majority, therefore chosen by 80,000 people, the size of one parliamentary constituency, having disastrously failed in the Foreign Office. And he's had some competition uh, in that. How was he viewed by your former colleagues in the Foreign Office? Oh, no. um, and the people in the Foreign Office had a very low opinion of him as an amateur and as somebody who didn't get through his work, because, you know, the functioning of a government department uh, depends on ministers every evening reading through the papers which they're given, on which they have to make decisions. And if they don't read the papers and make those decisions, then, then you know, things jam up and the, and the whole system doesn't work and civil servants can't do their job. And it was his, his laziness, rather than anything else, I think, which annoyed people enormously in the Foreign Office. Now, you're a, an open-air festival. Tell us about that. Is this your new line? Uh, well, I've been doing it for 10 years now, in fact. We run the, um, the Dune the Rabbit Hole Festival up here in uh, Port of Menteith in Scotland. Um, oh, very nice place. And, yeah, it's beautiful. We're, we're just on the edge of the Trossachs here. And we've got, uh, we've got a great lineup. We've got Hawkwind, we've got the Whalers. My goodness. Uh, we've got Sister Sledge. We're, we're going to have a, a good deal of fun. And we've got... Tristan, the new editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, coming to talk. We've got Annie Matchen. We've, you know, we've got a lot of interesting and profound speakers as well as the music. So it's music and talk. Uh, do you mean the real whalers, as in Bob Marley and the whalers? Exactly. The, 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 the real whalers, yep. And Hawk, uh, the real Hawkwind? Because I asked because I went to see the Beach Boys the other night at the Royal Albert Hall, and there wasn't a Beach Boy to be spotted on the stage. <laughs> no, I, I'm glad to say we're, we're, we're not in that position at all. Though we've got the we've got the real Hawkwind and, 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 and the real Whalers and the real Sister Sledge and, wow. and many many others. Yeah. And how long? Two hundred bands. How long does it go on? Uh, three days. Starts um, starts on Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So ne next weekend, basically. So people people can still get tickets. How do they do that, Craig? Um, yeah, if you go to doingtherabbithole.co. Dot UK. Tickets I'll... are still um, available. I think there are about 300 tickets left for the weekend. Uh, and it's beautiful weather here, and the Trossachs look lovely, and, um, and a great camping weekend. I used to go to the music camp at Aberfoyle, uh, quite uh, nearby, so I can testify. A very, very lovely place, but take some cream for the midges, won't you? Okay, so it's <laughs> doing, doing the rabbit hole dot com. Uh, .co.uk. Yeah, that's Doon as in D-O-U-N-E, no, yeah. as in the, the town. Yeah. I'll translate it for the, for the masses across the world. Honourable Craig Murray, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We'll try and get that up on the screen, that uh, ticket uh, uh, portal. If not, I'll uh, write it out and read it carefully uh, to you. I think we've got to take a break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in Tuesdays to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for Women in Society with Professor Hannah Dickinson, where we talk about the major issues, challenges, and struggles facing women in all aspects of society. Hannah Dickinson, professor and organizer with the Geneva Women's Assembly, joins the show this Tuesday and every Tuesday on Loud and Clear. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. What's 
the most important hour of the day. It's the Critical Hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon. On this show, we don't just deliver the latest headlines. We divide the real from the fake. Tune in to hear from some of the most brilliant political minds of today. Get in-depth news and analysis that goes beyond the surface and dig straight into the details. Set your clock to the Critical Hour for a news perspective unlike any of those other guys. Tune in to the Critical Hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon, weekdays 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, and catch us on Facebook Live. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Well, a uh, high Scottish quotient so far on tonight's show. I need calls from everywhere else in the world. I've had two uh, from Scotland. Uh, the next is David in Dunfermline. Go ahead, David. Hi, George. Nice I was to hear just, from you. Uh, about the, the emails and that, when I looked at the door, you had anything, just even going from department to department. If uh -huh. it was important enough, went in a green pouch, green bag, padlock and everything, and only the person that receives it has the key. Yeah. So why were they sending these things if it was so... Well, it's now, uh, it's now, of course, all done in emails. They're called telegrams, but in fact, they are encrypted emails. And right. from the US, um, from the embassy uh, in the US, uh, there's quite a wide circulation, so it would be uh, all the department heads in the uh, foreign office, it would be people in the treasury, people in the cabinet office, it would so be George, senior uh, government it, ministers. Do you think it's been done at this end then? Oh yeah, I'm sure it's been done deliberately here. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I'm also sure, and I think Craig uh, uh, nailed that uh, just a couple of minutes ago, I'm sure they're going yeah. to catch them quite quickly. Because if you're one of that circulation list and yeah. you diverted it, copied it, printed it off, they're going to know exactly who it was that did that. I would, so I would imagine I, I, so. I'm expecting an arrest this week and, uh, and a prosecution under the Official Secrets Act. Okay. It's good to see you again, George. And you, my friend. You used, to, you used to be at the MOD, were you? I was, I. Only lowly. <laughs> a lowly, a lowly soul. Uh, I wouldn't ask you uh, any secrets. Uh, trust, oh, me. trust me. Trust yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, you're living in Dunfermline now. Are you still working yeah. there? No, no. We got a redundancy notice. I'm afraid, George. As I'm afraid, quite a few did. Well, thank yeah. you, uh, thank yeah. you very much indeed, David, uh, for that. We've got lots of calls and lots of tweets coming in. Let me read another of the tweets. A.K.A. Taylor says, I don't always agree with your politics, but on this I certainly do. Best of luck if you go for it. Uh, Tony Watson says, explosive opening, agree or disagree, well worth listening to. And Z1570152, what is with this uh, long uh, list of numbers? Uh, asks a question. Do you really think the protests in Hong Kong are merely Western stirred? How can you deny 100,000s marching as some CIA Western stirred color revolution? Do you deny that China is totalitarian and a police state? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. How long have I got to answer that? Uh, first of all, I don't contend, have never contended, uh, that the protests in Hong Kong are merely Western stirred. But that doesn't mean they're not Western stirred. They quite plainly are being Western stirred. Quite plainly, Britain, on behalf, I believe, of the United States, is doing its best to cause problems for China in Hong Kong, uh, just as many other uh, ploys have been developed over decades to weaken China, to check its development, to uh, cause division in China, because it's only in a divided China that the unstoppability of China's economic rise uh, can be interrupted. 
So they've tried the Dalai Lama, they've tried the Falun Gong uh, religious sect, uh, they're now trying to exacerbate uh, pre-existing conflicts in Xinjiang with the Uyghur and other Muslim minorities in China, and Britain is taking advantage of its position in Hong Kong to cause problems for China. I don't think any serious person would dispute that, at least not when they saw the British colonial flag being hanged up inside the parliament building in Hong Kong by the protesters as they destroyed everything all around them. They smashed up and destroyed the parliament so that all that was left was the British colonial Hong Kong flag. And China uh, has been very clear in its condemnation of, uh, of Britain uh, in intriguing and interfering in what are sovereign Chinese affairs. Look, uh, Tony, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I can't even give you a name because it's Z1570152. Dear Z1570152, we should put your name. Let me be clear. The British never legitimately owned Hong Kong. They stole Hong Kong from China as a kind of ransom payment to punish China for refusing to take our opium that we were trading from India into China, creating scores, millions, hundreds of thousands, millions of drug addicts in China. China made the trade in that opium illegal. We bombarded China until it surrendered and gave us Hong Kong as a prize for stopping the bombardment. So we never legitimately held Hong Kong. But whether you agree with that or not, we gave it back in 1999 to its rightful owners, the Chinese People's Republic. And Prince Charles, Prince Charles uh, stood up and uh, made some comments whilst toasting uh, Dong Xiaoping, the Chinese leader at the time. And he gave some advice to the Chinese government on how they should handle this or that. And Dong Xiaoping answered in his toast, the days when foreign countries can give orders to China are over. And so they are. And so they should be. And so Britain should butt out of Hong Kong. It's not our business what happens in China. Of course, the people in Hong Kong have legitimate grievances, as people all over the world, including here, have legitimate grievances. And they're entitled to protest about them. But Britain and the United States are not entitled to interfere in China's internal affairs. And Hong Kong is an internal affair of the People's Republic of China. Well, the first hour's by. The next two hours come up after the news. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. What's the most important hour of the day? It's the Critical Hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon. On this show, we don't just deliver the latest headlines. We divide the real from the fake. Tune in to hear from some of the most brilliant political minds of today. Get in-depth news and analysis that goes beyond the surface and dig straight into the details. Set your clock to the Critical Hour for a news perspective unlike any of those other guys. Tune in to the Critical Hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon, weekdays 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, and catch us on Facebook Live. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Hi, this is Max Kaiser, and I'm with Stacey Herbert, and we're doubling down. Yeah, we're doubling down on crazy. We're doubling down on our new show called Double Down on Sputnik. It's doubling down on absolute joyous radio nirvana. You will love it. You will want to listen to every single episode on Sputnik. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Radio Sputnik.
Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. The Metropolitan Police has opened a probe into the leaked excerpts from the confidential cable sent to London from the British Ambassador to the US in which he described the White House as uniquely dysfunctional and described US President Donald Trump as inept, insecure and incompetent. The now resigned Sir Kim Durek believed US President Donald Trump pulled out of the landmark Iran nuclear deal for personality reasons because it was associated with his predecessor in the Oval Office, reports the Mail on Sunday. According to the top secret Diptel or diplomatic telegram, the UK envoy had suggested to Downing Street that the US President wanted to ditch the deal because it had taken and been brokered by his predecessor, Barack Obama. Sir Kim also suggested that the White House lacked a day after strategy on what the next steps should be after withdrawing from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as the deal was called. President Trump responded by taking to Twitter in an outburst with a spate of tweets branding the ambassador a pompous fool whom he would no longer deal with. He also put all the blame for the mess caused by the leak on outgoing Prime Minister. Theresa May. In 2015, the US, China, Britain, France, Russia and Germany signed a deal with Iran to limit its nuclear program in exchange for a partial removal of the international economic sanctions, when the, with the then US President Barack Obama helping broker the arrangement between Tehran and the West. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has responded to Hezbollah movement leader Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah's recent claims that Israel would be on the verge of vanishing in the event of a new war with the militant group. The warning came after Hezbollah Secretary General stated that Israel was in range of the Lebanese militant group's missiles. But the Israeli Prime Minister responded last week with a warning to Iranian lawmakers stating that Israeli warplanes, including its new F-35 stealth fighters, could reach anywhere in the Middle East, including Iran. Leaders and military officials from the two countries have repeatedly threatened one another, with Israel also accusing Iran of running anti-Israeli proxy campaigns in neighboring countries, including Lebanon and Syria. Iran has denied the claims and said its Syria aid was aimed at eliminating terrorists in the war-torn country. And finally, the Galileo Global Navigation Satellite System, created by the European Union at a cost of 10 billion euros, remains inoperational, with system administrators issuing an adversary notice to all users, saying that, until further notice, users experience a service outage. The signals are not to be used. Earlier, a source from the European Global Navigation Satellite Systems Agency, which operates Galileo, told InsideGNSS.com that the system's service would be degraded until further notice due to technical problems. Last year, the UK announced that it would explore the possibility of developing its own satellite navigation system after being shut out the Galileo program due to Brexit. British companies built a number of components for the system, with one of the project's two security monitoring centres, one based in Sandwich, UK, before the relocating to Spain. The UK expressed concerns over losing access to the system, which is used by government agencies and the British Armed Forces. Galileo is just one of a handful of global navigation systems in the world, working alongside the US's GPS, Russia's GLONASS and China's Bidu. The system was conceived in 1999 as a joint project between the EU and the European Space Agency with the first satellites for its constellation put into orbit in 2013. I'm Tamar Asfahani. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Well, I've lost my earpiece. Someone will have to come in and get it. And Tamar has just contradicted me. It was 1997, the transfer of sovereignty. But this was the 20th anniversary of something. That's what they were protesting about. So we'll have to resolve this conundrum. Is Tama right or am I right? You can let us know by phone, by Twitter or by Skype. Don't forget the Skypes because I haven't had any Skypes. That's GG Motes, G-G-M-O-A-T-S. If you want to Skype me, this is 
the mother of all talk shows. This is now the Global University of the Airwaves. It is the Global College of Knowledge. There are no tuition fees. You're positively encouraged to speak back to the teacher. If you have a point of view contrary to mine, it will be prioritized if you call, tweet, or otherwise message us. If you're a woman caller, if you're a first-time caller, if you are one of our legends, and I'll explain later when the first legend calls in exactly how people qualified as legends, you also will be prioritized. We're talking uh, about Ambassador Gate. We're talking about uh, Epstein and the impending trial of the centuries is going to make the O.J. Simpson trial look like small beer, I assure you. We're talking about Panorama, the sinking of the flagship of British current affairs television on the once proud BBC, the falling by the BBC from the gutter into the sewer. And we'll be asking Adam in the final hour. As far as possible, we're giving over the final hour to you and to me and Ask Adam. So hashtag Ask Adam if you've got any questions. I understand there's plenty flooding in now. But if you want to call or Skype me and or Adam, uh, please do so. It's the mother of all talk shows. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Chris from Denmark. Hamlet without the prince. Chris from Denmark. Hi, George. Very nice, very, very nice to hear from you again, sir. I was just fiddling with my earpiece. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, George, I would just like to ask you, uh, yeah. More or less about uh, uh, the recent event um, about the soldier uh, F being convicted for his uh, actions on Bloody Sunday. Yeah. And I seen a clip on YouTube uh, with three staunch Conservative MPs trying to defend the veterans um, and basically trying to create an argument that this soldier should not be convicted and mm. all Northern Ireland veterans should be completely. Um, freed from any conviction whatsoever. Mm. However, 28 people were shot on Bloody Sunday mm -hmm. and 14 people were killed. 13 yep. people were immediately killed and one person died shortly after. Five months prior to Bloody Sunday, the same parachute regiment killed 11 people in Bally Murphy, of which you can probably educate me about and many of your listeners about. But my question to you is, why is there nobody in the House of Commons defending the families or defending uh, uh, or, or, or being critical of the, of the British Army for what they did? I mean, you, hundreds of Republican uh, activists or uh, IRA um, terrorists, you could call them, were convicted for their role during the Troubles. But the amount of British soldiers convicted, you could count on the fingers of one hand. So why are British soldiers being lauded as heroes? And it's just, uh, I, I, just don't, I just don't understand it. Why well, is I think I've got your point and I'm grateful for it. The short answer as to why no one is speaking up for the families in the House of Commons is because I'm no longer in the House of Commons. Uh, Chris Williamson has been taken out at the legs and Jeremy Corbyn is uh, in a foxhole under intense bombardment. Uh, from all sides, uh, but principally from his own side. John MacDonald now declares his previous support for the Irish Republican cause to have been, quote, part of the problem because he's readying himself for a place in number 11 Downing Street. And we have an atrophied, shrunken political class. Uh, when I first entered Parliament, uh, more than 30 years ago now, there were scores, maybe more than a hundred uh, members of parliament that were regularly speaking out against the crimes of empire in the northeast of Ireland, in the occupied mm. six counties of Ireland. But that has shrunk yes. 
and shrunk and shrunk again until there's no one left uh, prepared to do it because of the ferocious attack that will follow. Uh, but not to worry, you and I can do it uh, here. Uh, I was uh, a participant in a brilliant documentary film about the Bally Murphy massacre, uh, which preceded the Bloody Sunday massacre and which did involve well, exactly which, the yeah, same unit. The well, there's still to be any full accounting uh, of what happened there, unarmed uh, men and women. Uh, a and, priest and priests well, uh, gunned down mm. uh, by the British Parachute Regiment uh, and maybe even by the same soldiers uh, in the British Parachute Regiment as shot down uh, the 28 people uh, in Derry uh, uh, very shortly thereafter, killing 13 on the day, 14 uh, in total, uh, shot dead, all of them unarmed, all of them exercising their uh, absolutely legal right to protest against British policy in the northeast of Ireland. Having said all of that, I'm uneasy uh, about uh, individual soldiers taking the rap for uh, British ministers who have never taken any rap for anything, have no accountability, and I'm in favor of a truth and reconciliation process in the north of Ireland in which everybody confesses what they did and sincerely attempts to reconcile yeah. with the victims and with the others. But one thing you can't have is one-sided, one-sided exemption for the British Army and British security forces the RUC and the UDR and the British Army regiments cannot be exempted from justice whilst others face justice and faced it and spent uh, many decades, many of them, in, uh, in prison as a result of their role in the troubles in the north of Ireland, the latest a batch of troubles of course there have been troubles mm, yes. for many uh, many centuries so yeah, uh, I mean, all, as, a, as, a, as, as, as half an Irishman I can say I wouldn't start from here I can say that we should have had a truth and reconciliation process like they had in South Africa where nobody gets prosecuted everybody gets freed from the terms of imprisonment they're mm -hmm. already serving and everybody yes. tells the truth about what happened, and then we can move forward. Last word to you. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you would think that the SDLP are still quite active in the, in the House of Commons. Are they? That they uh, well, I, don't, <laughs> I, would, I don't know, George, maybe you can tell me, but you would, I would think they've got a number of seats, uh, and, the, and the members of the SDLP should be standing up for the people uh, of the bog side, the people of there, and they're not just there, but... Uh, across uh, yeah. all the north of Ireland, but... Um, well, as I, I, as I always say, situation. as I always say, if my auntie had a beard, she'd be my uncle. Thanks very much for the call. Shah is in the United Arab Emirates. Let's cross the seas and talk to Shah. Go ahead, Shah. Hi, good evening. Good evening to you, sir. Okay, congratulations on your new show. It's, uh, Thank you. I hope you're enjoying it. Okay, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, uh, do you think that the recent policies of the U.S. towards Iran have, uh, have uh, um, put uh, uh, Iran firmly in the China and Russian camp, uh, maybe even permanently now? And the second question is, given that Britain is exiting Europe and looking for trade, have, uh, ha has the UK lost uh, potentially billions of dollars uh, worth of trade in given their recent actions towards uh, let's say the country of Iran? Well, two good uh, questions there. Uh, my first observation would be nothing is ever uh, forever. Nothing is ever permanent. So whilst, of course, Iran has now been pushed, as many other countries in the past have been pushed, into the orbit of China and Russia, uh, almost entirely because 
the United States is making war on Iran and the European Union is not doing very much about it and Britain is actively operating as an auxiliary, a small spear carrier uh, and sticking it into Iran. I wouldn't say that's necessarily forever. My understanding of Iranians is that they, they rather like America. Uh, they rather like Americans. They rather like American culture. Uh, and it's one of the great mysteries uh, of life that the United States has maintained a posture of such hostility towards Iran all this time that it has uh, done what you say, pushed Iran away from the United States and into other people's orbits. I personally would like to see Iran having good relations with everyone. Anyone who wants to buy Iran's products should be free to do so. Anyone who wants to sell to Iran should be equally free to do so. And nothing's uh, always forever because the UAE, for example, the country you're in, is presently leaving the war on Yemen uh, very quickly indeed, much to the consternation of your neighbors, Saudi Arabia, who hoped that the UAE would continue to share the blame, the guilt for the great crimes that are being uh, committed there. So um, there's nothing so constant as change. Everything changes. Uh, and uh, I live in hope that these things will change too. Last word to you, Kola. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's, thank uh, you, Shah. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for watching, listening, and calling. Let's take a quick break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in Tuesdays to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for Women in Society with Professor Hannah Dickinson, where we talk about the major issues, challenges, and struggles facing women in all aspects of society. Hannah Dickinson, professor and organizer with the Geneva Women's Assembly, joins the show this Tuesday and every Tuesday on Loud and Clear. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. What's the most important hour of the day? It's the Critical Hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon. On this show, we don't just deliver the latest headlines. We divide the real from the fake. Tune in to hear from some of the most brilliant political minds of today. Get in-depth news and analysis that goes beyond the surface and dig straight into the details. Set your clock to the critical hour for a news perspective unlike any of those other guys. Tune in to the critical hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon. Weekdays, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern. And catch us on Facebook Live. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Now, do stay tuned to Radio Sputnik. It really is a terrific station, uh, and there's shows from both sides of the Atlantic that are really very well worth listening to. So keep it on your dial, Radio Sputnik News. And, of course, this is a transatlantic show. We try to cover stories that are either British with an American angle or American with a British angle, or global, in which case, of course, we're both involved. And my next guest, I must tell you, is one of the finest journalists and broadcasters in America and a terrific analyst of political and current events. His name is Ben Norton. 
You'll catch him on Twitter. I follow him there. You'll catch him uh, on Facebook, on YouTube. You'll catch him on RT America uh, very often. He's a terrific guy. And I'm glad to say he joins us now by Skype. Ben, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, George. Glad to be here. Now, let me start by, an, uh, on the face of it, a non-political story, uh, which is the arrest and charging of this fellow Epstein. Now, Epstein was already convicted, but served a sweetheart sentence. He was represented by a legal dream team. His uh, chief counsel, I think, was the redoubtable Professor Alan Dershowitz. Uh, he got a sweetheart sentence, but now somehow the state are back on him again. He's been refused bail. He's in irons. He's going to be facing quite a bit of jail time if he's found guilty. Summarize, Ben, what he's facing, would you? Well, it's important to understand that, first of all, that this that Epstein, who is a billionaire, a plutocrat, has in the past actually been charged with pedophilia. He is a charged pedophile who has been accused of basically orchestrating a child sex trafficking ring. And this implicates not just him, but many prominent members of the American ruling class from both the Republican and the Democratic parties, which I think is one of the main reasons we actually have not heard much about the scandal until quite recently. It's actually very interesting for me because I and a few other journalists raised this issue in the 2016 presidential campaign largely because it implicated both Bill Clinton, who was on some of Epstein's planes two dozen times, and also Donald Trump. So it implicates leaders of both the Republican and Democratic parties who were on these planes that were orchestrated by Epstein. Now, what, what exactly were these planes? They were casually referred to as Lolita Express. Lolita is referencing the famous novel by the Russian novelist Nabokov, which is about a young girl in a relationship, a, a tiny girl in a relationship with an old man. I mean, it's a lot, to an extent about pedophilia, among other things. And that was the name kind of tongue-in-cheek, tongue-in-cheekingly given to these planes that were frequented by Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, and you mentioned Dershowitz. Dershowitz, who also happened to be the lawyer for Epstein. Dershowitz is also a key figure in the pro-Israel lobby who has viciously attacked scholars like Norman Finkelstein and really helped to tarnish the reputation and destroy the career of Professor Finkelstein and others. All of these figures are implicated in what Epstein was doing. And again, he has been accused of orchestrating a child sex trafficking ring and y multiple young women have accused uh, prominent politicians and prominent figures in the American ruling class of raping them when they were young girls. Uh, all the more remarkable then that this story has re-emerged. How do you account for that? It's one thing uh, people like you and I talking about it, but how has it ended up right at the center of uh, American political events? Well, as with many of these issues, you know, we've known about this for many years, and I think the reason that people are talking about it now is because of short-term political convenience. Now, many members of the Democratic Party are using this, rightfully, as a reason to harshly criticize the Donald Trump administration and also to criticize his now recently former Labor Secretary, Acosta. Uh, but of course, what they're not mentioning is that this implicates prominent Democrats like Bill Clinton. And like usual, this scandal implicates both members of the corporate parties that control U.S. politics, and each partisan member of the respective group is pointing the finger at the other group. So Republicans are saying that it, it's all about Bill Clinton. Democrats are saying it's all about Donald Trump. The reality is it's about the systemic rot that's at the core of the U.S. ruling class, of the U.S. political system, which is dominated by these kinds of figures who really have impunity. We've known about this for well over a decade now. And I mentioned Acosta. Acosta was the U.S. attorney who was actually leading the case against 
Epstein, uh, when he was when Epstein was being represented by Alan Dershowitz. And in this case, actually, an even more shocking detail that hasn't gotten a lot of mainstream media coverage is that Acosta actually said that when he was the U.S. attorney uh, working on prosecuting Acosta, uh, working on prosecuting Epstein, rather, that Acosta said that one of the reasons they only slapped Epstein on the wrist and didn't actually significantly punish him, Acosta claimed that as he was pers pursuing this case against Epstein, that he was told to back off the case. And the quote is, Acosta said that he was told that Epstein belongs to intelligence, that he was a significant intelligence asset. Now, whose intelligence asset he was is not entirely clear. Whether they're referring to the CIA or referring to a U.S. intelligence agency or a foreign intelligence agency. We know that Epstein has also been close to Saudi Arabia uh, and he's also been close to Israel and close to other major U.S. allies. So this actually might go even deeper. And we're just beginning to see the, the surface level details of this shocking scandal that once again, I said, exposes the systemic rot within the U.S. political system. And the unfortunate reality is that the only reason now we're actually hearing about it is because it's politically convenient in the short term. Unfortunately, I have a feeling that in the long term, this will once again be swept under the rug. Well, uh, it may be uh, politically convenient in the short term as a stick to beat uh, Trump with, although Trump has said that uh, he hasn't spoken to Epstein for 15 years. Uh, and that he never uh, respected him much. Although I see some news today that he had a party, just the two of them, him and Epstein, and 28 young girls, not underage girls, but uh, very, very young girls, uh, bunnies, models, and so on. So Trump obviously, once upon a time, uh, lived in the same swamp as uh, Epstein and the others. But I would have said, from where I'm standing, the Clintons are more exposed uh, on the Epstein case than Trump is. What do you say? No, I think you're absolutely right. Of course, uh, Trump in the past has actually talked fav very favorably about Epstein. And Trump, in fact, made a ridiculous comment several years ago talking about how he knew that Epstein was very fun and that he was really into young girls, very young girls. And you can easily find that quote online. But I do agree with you. I, I don't think we should downplay Donald Trump's implication in this scandal. And he certainly was a big part of it. But you're right that Bill Clinton is even more deeply implicated. I mentioned that flight logs show that Bill Clinton was on Epstein's planes two dozen times. And there were numerous cases in which Clinton traveled on the Epstein's planes without his secret service guards. So that itself raises questions. Why was you know, this former president traveling without Secret Service on these planes where young girls have repeatedly said that they were raped by by prominent politicians and leading members of the American ruling class. But once again, I, I think we should stress that this is not a partisan issue. This is a reflection of the fact that the billionaires and plutocrats and politicians that control American politics and control politics in Britain and many other parts of the world and in, in the capitalist world, these figures have impunity. They can carry out these egregious criminal acts and at most get slapped on the wrist. And eventually, if they do face some kind of punishment, it will eventually get pushed under the rug, swept under the rug, and we won't hear about it again. And another point to underscore is that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump actually were friends. They were longtime friends for many years. We know, for instance, that Donald Cr Trump built a significant golf course in New York that was quite close to the home of the Clintons, and that until 2016 in the presidential campaign, Bill Clinton, in fact, had a personal locker at this Donald Trump golf course. We, of course, have seen photos of them attending each other's weddings. We've seen photos of them hugging each other. We've seen photos of Bill Clinton and Donald Trump playing golf together. So it, once again, I just want to stress this point. The ruling class in the U.S. is not partisan. The capitalist class that governs this country and many other capitalist countries is comprised of different factions that are all part of the same team. They're all on the same team. and. 
now that it's politically convenient for the Clintons and the Trumps to claim that they hate each other, they will claim that. But just four years ago, they were still friends. Fascinating. Now, there are British names in Epstein's uh, little black book. Uh, Peter Mandelson. I don't know if uh, he means anything to you, but he does mean a lot over here. His name is there 10 times, 10 different telephone numbers uh, belonging to Mandelson. Uh, Tony Blair uh, traveled on the Lolita Express, although we don't know what he uh, did or where he was going, not yet anyway. Uh, but there's also a royal name uh, in the frame, uh, Prince Andrew. Uh, one of the sons of Her Majesty the Queen. Is that attracting any attention? Well, it's not getting much attention here in the U.S., but it underscores the fact that I've just been stressing again and again that the ruling class that governs capitalism throughout the world is an international class. Their loyalty is not necessarily to one nation. Their loyalty is only to profits and to making more money. And it's not surprising to see that a billionaire plutocrat in the U.S., was also taking British ruling class figures on these disgusting plans. Very interesting. Now let's turn, uh, Ben, to the uh, political scene. We're following the Democratic Party uh, pre-primary uh, uh, process. We have uh, talked every week, actually, on the show about who was up, who was down. Uh, full disclosure, uh, I'm very much uh, hoping uh, that uh, Bernie Sanders can be the uh, Democratic Party nominee, not because necessarily I think he's the best of their nominees, but I think he's the best of those who can win it and who might go on to win the presidency. But that's my personal uh, bias, nothing to do with Radio Sputnik, of course. Uh, but who would you say in the last week has been up and who has been down? Well, George, I agree with your analysis. The candidate, I frankly think the only realistic candidate who can even beat Trump would be Bernie Sanders. We have seen in the past week, to answer your question, but also the increasing trend in the recent months, is that there really have been three Democratic Party candidates who I think are most likely to be the party's candidate in the national election. That is Bernie Sanders, although the Democratic Party, the DNC leadership has tried everything it can, not just now, but in the 2016 election, to destroy Bernie Sanders and to prevent him from being the candidate. So even though I think he is clearly the most popular candidate among average Americans, among working class Americans, the Democratic Party is going to try to prevent him from being the candidate. And then the other two candidates who, at least according to mainstream polls, are the most likely candidates, would be Elizabeth Warren, and I can talk about her in a moment, and then Joe Biden. Now, it's very clear that the DNC, the, the corporate party apparatus that is funded by large corporations that has a close link to intelligence agencies and the U.S. government, the DNC clearly wants Biden to be the candidate. But Biden is a very, very bad candidate uh, for many reasons. Uh, he's at, at best a center-right candidate. I mean, he's in the past few weeks been repeatedly defending and whitewashing former segregationists who he worked with in the Congress, segregationists who strongly supported the apartheid system of Jim Crow in the U.S. He also can't get his hands off of little girls, which is just disgusting, and he ref even refuses to apologize for it. In, in this past week, in fact, Joe Biden was protested by a, a Latino man who was talking about how during the Obama administration, in which Biden was vice president, the Obama administration deported more people than any other administration in U.S. history, nearly three million people. And this Latino man who was protesting Biden pointed out that some of his own family members were deported under Obama. And Biden refused to apologize for this record level of deportations under the Obama administration and continued to defend the policies of the Obama administration and said that he would continue them if he were president. Now, this is a key issue here among Democrats because, of course, the Donald Trump administration, although it's barbaric policies against immigrants, of course, are not new. And there are many ways an extension of the bipartisan anti-immigrant policies of both the George Bush administration and Barack Obama. 
it is true that the, the Donald Trump administration has really ramped up extremely racist, bigoted rhetoric against immigrants. Of course, the, the Trump administration has been separating families. And many Democrats rightfully have been trying to distinguish themselves from those policies and say that they're going to try to change those policies. Although, of course, they won't mention that Obama carried them out. But Biden is, is not even pretending to do that. Biden is not just tacking to the center. He's moving to the right. And he shows a decades long strategy of the Democratic Party, which is that if we, if we want to try to win an election against a Republican, we're not going to actually fight for progressive social democratic policies that average Americans want. Instead, we're going to move further and further to the right in every single election. Hillary Clinton did it, and now Biden is running even further to the right of the campaign Hillary, that yeah. Hillary Clinton ran. And that's yeah. why I think it's very clear that if Biden were the candidate, he would actually lose to Donald Trump. I think you're right that Sanders is the most likely candidate who can actually beat Trump. Tell us a bit, uh, briefly, if you would, about Elizabeth Warren. She's not really very well known here at all, uh, but she's running, I suppose, to the left of Biden, but to the right of Sanders. Would that be right? Absolutely. I think Warren is the second most likely DNC-backed candidate. Now, that doesn't mean that she's the most popular by far. I think Bernie is much more popular than she is. But I think the DNC, which is terrified of Bernie, would probably be okay with Warren. She would be the consensus candidate. Clearly, Wall Street and large corporations and billionaires, they want Biden because they know that he's not going to take challenge their economic interests. He's not going to regulate corporations. Elizabeth Warren is a kind of centrist, social democratic leaning candidate, but who is not going to challenge capital too aggressively. Now, Bernie Sanders calls himself a socialist and, you know, he's got a lot of issues. No one's perfect. And we can talk about what that means. But Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren definitely does not use the S word. She no. will not call herself a socialist. In fact, Elizabeth Warren will say pretty ex explicitly, I'm a capitalist, but I want to regulate capitalism. I want to return to a kind of Keynesian capitalism. And she doesn't talk about class struggle. She doesn't talk about taking on the billionaires. Instead, she says, we need to regulate large corporations. We need to talk about maybe even breaking up some of the tech monopolies, and maybe we can tax, tax the rich. Now, that is, of course, welcome compared to Biden. Biden's not even pretending to do that. So in that sense, she certainly is running to the left of Biden, but she doesn't actually pose a threat to the ruling class in the same way that someone like, like Bernie does. And in fact, we saw in this past week that a very prominent billionaire, Haim Saban, who is a key funder of Democratic and even some Republican politicians, Haim Saban said that he's fine with any Democratic Party candidate except, except Bernie. Bernie, which says a lot. It says everything for me. Ben Norton, a great pleasure to have you on the mother of all talk shows. I hope we'll talk again before very long. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Let's take a quick break. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country. What's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us? Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. On Sputnik with Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. Tune in. Well, maybe mention, maybe mention like central bankers and, and you know markets are doubling down. Not you're saying everybody's doubling down. They're crazy. They are. Everyone's crazy. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, Progressive Democrats of America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of The Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. 
Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning and I'm looking for what's on the queue for the day, I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Ali and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Lots of traffic, lots of callers, uh, not actually any Skypes yet, so if you're in a position to, it's GG Motes, GG M O A T S. Here we've got this uh, Rob Juno, uh, says George Galloway gives history a good spanking. Uh, Caldy UK says George back on form, funky jacket and the trademark hat firmly back where it belongs. Thank you for that. Patrick McCarthy says, is America a corporation of the British Empire or the other way around? It's the other way around for sure. And John Duffy says, what's your opinion on an independent Scotland? We'll have to deal with that on another night, I think. But in short, I'm not in favour of it. But if the Scots want it, they're fully entitled uh, to it. Let's take some more calls. Tina's on the line. Go ahead, Tina. Timor, I beg your pardon. Timor. Uh, uh, hi, George. I beg your pardon. Evening, I beg your pardon, Timor. Yeah, that's all. Right. No Go problem. Ahead. Go ahead, sir. George, um, I'd like to um, raise a point. I'm a Turkish Cypriot. Okay. And indeed, um, you know, it's been in, the, in you know the Turkish news that um, the Greek Cypriots um, no way wish to share the hydrocarbons found um, within um, their economic zone. Um, Turkey has said that the Turkish Cypriots have a right or a percentage to what's been found. Um, the Greek Cypriots in hand have made um, contracts with various um, petroleum companies, um, French, the um, Israelis, the Egyptians have all got their hand and they're all involved. Um, now Turkey is um, advocating that, you know, he as a country is going to do what's best for the Turkish Cypriots. Since 1974, um, there's been a division on the island. The Turkish Cypriots have um, lived under an embargo, uh, not recognised by anyone in the world. Um, I feel that this needs to change. Um, nobody in the British government cares in the slightest. Well, absolutely uh, correct. Uh, the division uh, began with a Turkish invasion uh, of the northern part of Cyprus. A line was drawn and now two entities exist. It used to be the Turkish Cypriots that were blamed for failing to uh, achieve reunification. But uh, actually, in recent years, it's the Greek Cypriots who are refusing to reunify the island. And this has now become a potential flashpoint uh, with the division of territorial waters uh, on the oil and gas fines that are there. Uh, and the Cypriot one's not the only potential flashpoint. You can imagine a flashpoint which involves Israel, Gaza, the Palestinian uh, entity, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, you can imagine the potential flashpoints that exist there. So somebody's going to have to 
uh, get everyone uh, down around a table, those that can be around the same table uh, with each other, and where they can't, they'll need to be bilateral uh, negotiations and deals done. But one thing you cannot have is Gaza not getting its share, Northern Cyprus not getting its share, or Lebanon getting cheated out, cheated out of its share, uh, because if you do, you'll get war, Timor. That's the long and the short of it. Last word to you, my friend. Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, that would be a perfect um, situation where they actually, you know, everyone sat down and said, right, this is what I need, etc., and come to an agreement. But with respect to um, the 1974, I mean, uh, it was never an invasion. I mean, it was um, a reaction um, to what was going on on the island at the no, time. Trust me, it was, trust me, Timor, it was an invasion. I was, uh, I was uh, on the march in London that day, uh, the, the Saturday of the week that it happened, and we've all seen the paratroopers uh, dropping in. Of course, there were provocations and so on uh, before it, but uh, I'm afraid you can't say it wasn't an invasion uh, because it happened in plain sight. Timor, thanks uh, very much indeed. Uh, I've got a caller in New York uh, up next. Jesse in New York. Go ahead, sir. Hi. So I obviously oppose the whole American intervention in Syria, but didn't Bashar kill the prime minister of Lebanon in 2005? I, I mean, he's a I fascist, right? And, uh, he's not a fascist, and he didn't kill the prime minister of Lebanon. Uh, in, uh, uh, who killed him? Uh, I don't know who killed him, but nobody's ever uh, said that it was President Bashar. Anyway, go on. Okay, then what about the things we can verify? Like, Putin is elected and, um, you know, Yankovic in Ukraine was elected, but wasn't Bashar given power by his father? Uh, yes, he was. Uh, the political system uh, in Syria has to change. There has to be proper democratic elections. But I've got some news for you, which might actually be bad news for you, I'm inferring that. Yeah. If there was an election held tomorrow, entirely free and fair, Bashar al-Assad would win a landslide victory. That's partly as a result of his stewardship of the dreadful trials of the last period of war and foreign invasion and extremist infestation, uh, but it's also uh, partly uh, as a result of how people have seen up close and personal his opposition. Uh, and anyone who is in any way tainted with Al-Qaeda and with ISIS and all the rest, uh, they won't show their face uh, in the country ever again. So, uh, yes, there should be uh, democratic elections in Syria. That's the good news for you. The bad news for you might be that Bashar would win them out of the park. Go ahead. Uh, no, that's fair enough, George. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, in New York... Uh, let's take some uh, more calls. Nicola is in Swindon. Go ahead, Nicola. Good evening to you, George. Um, I gather you'll be talking about Brexit later on this evening, but let me just uh, sure. sort of, uh, mention one thing, first of all. Several of the Tory MPs have expressed this desire to suspend Parliament to get a no-deal Brexit through, the par through, through as such, yeah. by actually suspending Parliament. Yeah. Yet one of the things lots of us voted for when we voted... Uh, to leave was we wanted the sovereignty of our own parliament, and I see that a bit of sort of uh, cross purposes there. I don't know. I know. I know. I know you're probably in favour of a No Deal Brexit, but I see that. Uh, uh, well, it's not that I'm in. It's, it's not that I'm in favour of it, Nicola. Nobody in their right mind would prefer a No Deal Brexit. I just prefer a No Deal Brexit to no Brexit at all. And well, more. And, 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 and moreover, if you uh, if you don't make it clear and you were a railway worker, I feel sure that in the, the, the most basic shop steward's manual, it tells you that when you go in to negotiate with anyone, uh, you must not take off the table the possibility that you'll walk out without a deal. Because if you take that off the table, you're guaranteeing a bad deal. So it's not that I oh, want. Yeah. Uh, it's not that I want a no deal. I just prefer a no deal to no uh, Brexit. But I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to uh, make you annoyed uh, about this prorogation uh, business. You see, I don't believe in the sovereignty of Parliament. 
I believe in the sovereignty of the people. Parliament does not have sovereignty over the people. The people have sovereignty over the parliament. And what we have here now is an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. The people voted for Brexit, very clearly. And then yeah, they... You haven't annoyed me. You haven't annoyed okay. me at all. No, no, then it's, just a, it's another way of looking at it, and I yeah. respect your opinion. Well, yeah, no, I'll... I don't get annoyed about that. All so. right. Uh, I mean, honestly, Nicola, if the parliament is going to block the people's decision, not just in the referendum 2016, but in the general election 2017, when both the major parties pledged that they would implement the Brexit decision, uh, both of whom have now deserted that pledge, either explicitly or implicitly, in the case of the Labour Party's new position. If Parliament is going to block the decision of the people, I'm for closing the Parliament. As a matter of fact, let me l let you in on a secret. The state of that Parliament, we'd be better off if they shut it till next Christmas or even next Easter until we can have a new election. That would be the best solution of all. I've got a little secret for you as well. I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Thank Let's you. take a break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us. From mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful uh, water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, and I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Everyone is welcome. Not just that, everyone is coming in through our various portals uh, on all the platforms that we are on record numbers and I hope a record spread of countries. The wonderful Elizabeth, you may recall, uh, not last week because she was off, but the week before, gave us a quick summary of where people are listening and what they're saying where they are. Elizabeth, welcome back. We Happy missed you last back. week. I uh, tell you. us uh, how it's going on YouTube and on Facebook. A lot of international. I think there's a common thing that someone will message saying, oh, where's everyone listening to you from today? And then we've got a lot of people. We've got Canada, we've got Germany, we've got Sweden, Wales, Belgium, Copenhagen, Portugal, all over the place. So Fantastic. a lot of people Good saying news. hi. Truly global. Yes, and um, a lot of people really enjoying um, Ben's interview. He's terrific. The Skype interview, yeah. Um, I told, I told everyone response. he's terrific, and yeah. he showed it. A lot of people are questioning um, why, when in the US uh, there's all this awful news about um, people like Epstein yeah. and the Trump administration, why people are t so keen in the UK on attacking Jeremy Corbyn, and that we're yes. quite lucky in the UK to have... In fact, some of the people that are most implicated in this uh, Epstein uh, scandal are the people most hostile to Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Ironic that. All the more surprising that it's now come out. Yeah, and um, KB on YouTube has a question. He questions that there'll never be, questions that'll never be asked in mainstream media. Who all in, in our government was involved with Epstein and which state sponsor is he working for? So he said he wouldn't be surprised basically if someone in the UK 
has been involved. Well, I'm waiting to see yeah. what uh, contemporary British political figures are named and not necessarily shamed because yes. you, you haven't done anything criminal mm. just by meeting Epstein or even flying on his plane. And we've got Blair, we've got uh, Mandelson, we've got Prince Andrew. Uh, they've all taken hospitality uh, from uh, Epstein of one kind uh, or another. But I wonder if any of the serving leaders now uh, have uh, any involvement with them. We'll, we'll watch uh, with bated breath yeah. for that. Reg also says that about people that are questioning whether Trump really was ever that involved. He says there are lots of legitimate reasons to criticize Trump. Trump. He um, exploited the New York bankruptcy to avoid tax. So why would they make anything up? Well, I think Trump is, uh, is uh, damaged by the Epstein affair. Uh, I just think that the Clintons are damaged more, which uh, is why yeah. I'm surprised that it's broken. Yeah. Because it's the supporters of the Clintons that are calling most of the shots these days. And interesting that it didn't get more coverage in 2016. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I knew about it in 2016 because I'm a, I'm a, a news <laughs> uh, addict, but uh, most people a lot of never people, heard of yeah, Epstein until, didn't. until these next uh, few days. And then in general about the elections, somebody's made a phone comment about Darren on YouTube said that Elizabeth Warren is like our Ed Miliband. <laughs> yeah, she is a bit uh, female Ed Miliband, even a bit Theresa May-ish. She even looks and, and talks a bit. I know what Theresa you mean. May I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, and so if you're watching, Theresa May was not a success. And Trust then finally, um, a lot of people questioning what Ben was saying about Sanders being the only candidate to beat Trump. A lot of yeah, people tell me, a lot of people Facebook behind... Facebook and YouTube questioning it, actually. Yeah. And uh, who, who did they seem to lean to? There was no names no? mentioned. You see, Tulsi um, Gabbard like is either. a powerful uh, candidate. And actually, her politics, as expressed so far, quite a few things she hasn't expressed, but on the wars and so on, she gets a, a star from me. But my position is she cannot win the nomination and even if she did, she could not beat Donald Trump. So I'm trying to balance it. I'm hoping for someone that, whose politics I like best who can beat uh, Donald Trump. Otherwise, Trump's in for another four years. And that might mean that Bolton's in for another four years and all the other uh, characters. Last word to you, Elizabeth. Um, that's everything. There's got one last lovely message from Socialist Booksy. It's a fun uh, Twitter handle. He says he's loving the new format. Um, it's already a firm part of his Sunday night. He loves everything from being able to watch on YouTube to be able to do Skype interviews. A lot of people are enjoying the fact you can actually yeah, see your this, callers. The, yeah, the Skype interview is a big step forward. Oh, there. yeah. And much better audio. <laughs> yeah, much better. Uh, Elizabeth, thanks yep. uh, very much. Don't that's go away again. We need you here uh, on Sundays, and we missed you last Sunday. This is the mother of all talk shows. And it is the Global College of Knowledge. We've got an hour left, which will take your calls uh, for the most part, but it will also have one guest of great importance, as well as Ask Adam, the cleverest man in England. Our guest is the author of several science fiction novels. And don't tell Adam I said so, but he definitely in the running in any race with Adam as the cleverest man in England. Ergo, I'm going to have definitely the two cleverest men in England at this table on this show. Well, it is an open university of the airwaves. One hour still to come. Stay tuned. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business. 
and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Paul Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. The Metropolitan Police has opened a probe into the leaked excerpts from confidential cables sent to London from the British Ambassador to the US in which he described the White House as uniquely dysfunctional and described US President Donald Trump as inept, insecure and incompetent. The now resigned Sir Kim Durek believed that US President Donald Trump pulled out of the landmark Iran nuclear deal for personality reasons because it was associated with his predecessor in the Oval Office, reports the Mail on Sunday. According to the top secret Diptel or diplomatic telegram, the UK envoy Voice suggested to Downing Street that the US president wanted to ditch the deal because it had broken brokered by his predecessor Barack Obama. Sir Kim also suggested the White House had lacked a day after strategy on what the next step should be after withdrawing from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as the deal was called. President Trump responded by taking to Twitter in an outburst with a spate of tweets, branding the ambassador as a pompous fool whom he would no longer deal with. He also put all the blame for the mess caused by the leak on outgoing Prime Minister Theresa May. In 2015, in the US, China, Britain, France, Russia and Germany signed a deal with Iran to limit its nuclear program in exchange for a partial removal of international economic sanctions, with the then US President Barack Obama helping broker the arrangement between Tehran and the West. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has responded to Hezbollah movement leader Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah's recent claims that Israel would be on the verge of vanishing in the event of a new war with the militant group. The warning came after the Hezbollah Secretary General stated that Israel was in range of the Lebanese militant group's missiles, but the Israeli Prime Minister responded last week with a warning to Iranian lawmakers stating that Israeli warplanes, including its new F-35 stealth fighters, could reach anywhere in the Middle East, including Iran. Leaders and military officials from the two countries have repeatedly threatened one another, with Israel Israel also accusing Iran of running anti-Israeli proxy campaigns in neighboring countries, including Lebanon and Syria. Iran has denied the claims and has said that Syria, that the aid to Syria was aimed at eliminating terrorists in the war-torn country. And finally, the Galileo Global Navigation Satellite System, created by the European Union at a cost of 10 billion euros, remains inoperational, with system administrators issuing an adversary no advisory notice to all users saying that until further notice, users experience a, serv a service outage. The signals are not to be used. Earlier, a source from the European Global Navigation Satellite Systems Agency, which operates Galileo, told inside GNSSS.com that the system service would be degraded until further notice due to the technical problems. Last year, the UK announced that it would explore the possibility of developing its own satellite navigation system after being shut out of the Galileo program due to Brexit. British companies built a number of components for the system, with one of the project's two security monitoring centres based in the UK, before being rolled relocated to Spain. The UK expressed concerns over losing access to the system, which is used by government agencies and the British Armed Forces. Galileo is one of just a handful of global navigation systems in the world, working alongside the US's GPS, Russia's GLONASS and China's Beidou. The system was conceived in 1999 as a joint project between the EU and the European Space Agency, with the first satellites for its constellations put into orbit in 2013. I'm Tamar Osfahani. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. 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 Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Yeah. I've got a problem again with this earpiece, so I won't be able to hear any orders from Tama. You may say, 
that is a coincidence. Uh, others might think uh, differently. Now, Keith Mansfield is the author of a really fine and beautifully produced book, The Future in Minutes. He's also uh, uh, an author of note, even a script writer for, amongst uh, uh, other things, rather well-known American pop singers. I'll let him uh, break that news uh, to you. He is the closest to a Renaissance man, as you're going to find outside of Adam Gary. Uh, he's of Cambridge University, of Oxford University, and he's working in association with the University of Berkeley. He is uh, uh, a man who can turn his hand to anything from the universe to driverless cars. I know that because I interviewed him for our Sputnik on RT television program, which went out yesterday, and you can see it on YouTube. Keith, welcome back. I couldn't let uh, the opportunity slip uh, of having you back on the show because I've been thinking ever since we uh, talked uh, about the things we talked about. Uh, and I don't mean Lionel Richie. <laughs> I don't mean the fact that you're a writer for Lionel Richie. I mean your predictions for the future are both startlingly frightening and also rather inspiring. So just in a nutshell, just talk us through what kind of future uh, we have ahead of us. Well, th thank you for having me back. It's lovely to see you again. I'm not sure I can compete with Adam. Um, and no, no one can really compete with Adam, <laughs> but uh, you're definitely in the race. But the, the future, um, and, and the future starts now, and it goes all the way through to the end of the universe, really, and that's in the book. And sometimes it's easier to predict things billions of years from now, like what will happen yeah, because to the nobody knows if it's going to happen or not. Ending, and of course you can't be held to account. Exactly. So, so that's one thing. Whereas predicting things in the near term is harder. Like if you had somebody at the turn of the 20th century and they didn't foresee powered flight or the internal combustion engine, they'd get the 20th century wrong. In the 20th century, if you didn't predict computers, what a change that's made to sure, our world. Sure. And then the engine of the future, I think, comes from the 20th century and what we call Moore's Law after Gordon Moore, um, who was at Intel, who showed that the number of processors on a chip doubled every couple of years. And doubling doesn't sound much at first, but if it keeps happening and it's kept yeah. happening from the 60s, then in 30 years' time, a computer is a million times more powerful than today. So in 2050, imagine what computing technology will be like. And if that continues in 2080, a million million, so a trillion times more powerful than today. So... That's mind-boggling, that. I, I mean, if, if we think they're powerful now, imagine yeah, what they'll be like let's then. Let's uh, get some terms or some definitions. Absolutely. Now, if the rate of technological progress that we experienced in the 20th century mm -hmm. were to continue through the 21st century, what would be the most significant changes that we'd know? Okay, so, I mean, it, it seems as though that rate is actually speeding up. Oh, wow. Um, so... Because we, we, we started the 20th century with with a horse drawn, absolutely, uh, and we ended it with the supersonic flight and uh, and flight to and, Mars, and 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 all those things, and the technology that we've created enables better, faster, more efficient communication. We all have pretty much the sum of the world's knowledge in our pockets in what we call a phone, but it's really a powerful computer. And so the big change that people are looking towards that may happen in this century, they call the singularity, and it's that moment when machines become more intelligent than people. And machines, something they're very good at is running algorithms, computers, uh, and there's a process that we call recursive self-improvement, where they can run these algorithms very, very quickly. Does that frighten and, you, that prospect? Oh, yes. Um, so they could, they, there could be an intelligence explosion, we call it, where they go 
very quickly from the level of just a little brighter than a human to millions of times smarter. Um, and so, and, and the reason why we're the dominant species on the planet isn't because we are stronger or run faster or have sharper teeth or claws, it's because we have the best brains and, and are the most intelligent species. So if we're no longer the most intelligent species on the planet, then that has enormous implications That's for what the happened in uh, Kubrick's uh, 2001, didn't it? Absolutely. How, and how uh, became uh, the, smarter than the, the how astronauts that were using him. Uh -huh. And also conflicted, but but yes, and and so how you control the very smart computers is is a major problem because you might only have one chance to do it, and that's <laughs> yeah. it, it's something. Well, we'll always be able to pull the plug out. I hope <laughs> we've not got a lot of time, so let's start with something more prosaic. Uh huh. Um, as you know, my fear is that. Whilst I'm not a Luddite, I welcome leaps in technology, but unless they're accompanied by leaps in sociology, mm -hmm. then all they're going to do is put large numbers of workers out of work, who will then not have wages to buy the products of the people who are doing the leaping. And this is so important. Um, the wealth that we create in the world and the wealth that's created through all these fabulous technologies gets bigger and bigger. And overall, the wealth uh, grows, but it, at the moment it's very concentrated in uh, the giant tech companies and individuals. And unless that's shared out among everybody, then yeah, well, what, take, what will be the point? Take your driverless car. You're, you're uh -huh. perfectly convinced not only that we're going to quite soon have driverless cars, but that they will be safer than human-driven cars. Indeed. But what about, uh, what about all the workers that drive for a living? What about, uh, what about a truck full of material hurtling down the motorway driven by a computer? Uh -huh. And so I, I, I think there's another disruptive technology that I hope is coming, which is about decentralizing the world and giving back control to individuals, many more organizations like cooperatives sharing the benefits of, of their work. And if you're creating a company that doesn't have to pay shareholders or bosses or owners if the ownership is shared by everybody and almost by no one, then the companies that have to pay that rent on top won't be able to compete. Mm. Um, and so that's the hope that we change the way we think about everything by decentralizing, by giving people yeah, more although, although control over their on that, lives. Uh, progress on that is turning out, uh, Keith, to be much slower than and the technological progress. But, but these things, they're bubbling under the surface. People are working on them. We see little bits of it like cryptocurrencies and the development of the blockchain, stuff mm. like that. So technology can help this. And it's a bit like when the web first happened and they were kind of boom and bust. Everyone knew it was going to be big, but then it fell back again. And now we can't imagine a world without the no, web. Right. And the blockchain, I think, will enable a lot of good things in terms of the wider world. You can kind of leapfrog a lot of the technology like you don't have to lay cables or telegraph wires or things like that anymore you can beam mm. high-powered internet from space and stuff like that so and it's in everybody's interests even the the big tech companies and things like that to create wider bigger markets for more people to share share the benefit it's look it's uh Utterly fascinating. We literally could talk for three hours uh, about it, but alas, the hour means that we can't. This is the book. I thoroughly recommend it to you. I've read mine. Uh, it's called The Future in Minutes, 200 Futuristic Concepts, Technologies and Their Consequences, explained in an instant, which is a big boast, but actually one that is lived <laughs> up to. Keith Mansfield and the publisher is Quercus. Anywhere else they can get it? All good bookshops and so on? All good bookshops all around the world. Fantastic. Adam, thank you very Keith, much for having well, me. I'd like to bring you back in again for a longer talk, but thanks very much indeed for dropping in in person. It's been on a pleasure. On the mother of all talk shows. Adam Gary is up next. Ask Adam, if you will.
We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country, what's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us. Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. On Sputnik with Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. Tune in. Well, maybe mention, maybe mention like central bankers and, and you know markets are doubling down. Not you're saying everybody's doubling down. They're crazy. They are. Everyone's crazy. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, Progressive Democrats of America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning and I'm looking for what's on the queue for the day, I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Ali and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Well, a lot of people, uh, unconscionably, are asking where I got my jacket. <laughs> well, it's second-hand vintage, like everything I wear, because my wife has a second-hand vintage clothing shop, which is called Emma Goldman Vintage, and it's in Portobello uh, area in, uh, in West London. Uh, so uh, she may even have one or two more of these if you're nearby. It's made by a company called Sewell, S-E-W-E-L-L, but I'm sure they're long out of business. The label looks like uh, kind of 1950s, 1960s. I'm joined, of course, by the cleverest man in England. Now, the, the previous cleverest man in England, Keith, does writing for Lionel Richie. Mm. You, the cleverest man in England, are also a music man. Indeed. You produce music, you play music, you're an aficionado of music. And I'm not talking classical music, though he's an expert on that. <laughs> but even uh, rock music. And you, you and I were recently at the Average White Band. Uh, Far above both, average. Uh, enjoyed it. Uh, well, well above average white. Not entirely band. white anymore. So, uh, not entirely white <laughs> anymore. Indeed, without the uh, black uh, drummer and the black singer, uh, they wouldn't have been nearly as good. Indeed. Um, so, it is possible for very clever people not to be monomaniacal, not to have blinkers on and stick only to their subjects. You're both actually uh, living examples of that. Well, 
I, I'm always honored when you call me the cleverest man in England, but I don't even consider myself the cleverest man in this room, albeit <laughs> if, you can get away with it because you're Scottish, so there's an asterisk next to the little qualification. But in any way, I think that learning should be fun. And I think why a lot of people, myself included, don't particularly like schools is because they take information and they boil it down to the most unfun and uninteresting anodyne factoids that they could possibly get away with. And that's before the whips and chains. Well, I'm talking about an older style of school as opposed to Jeffrey Epstein's uh, last weekend the before kind of prison. The school that most of our rulers went to. <laughs> Indeed. But um, the, the point is, I think that learning should be fun. And that's why I think that we've got to get away from this idea of elitism, whether it's in education or in media or in music. I've written about that quite a lot lately, how elitism has actually ruined classical music, European classical music in particular, by taking away the human emotions which naturally drives away the human audiences. So we've got to think of the world as more of a chest of oysters or a box of sweets rather than a sort of Pandora's box of sand, which is how elitist art, elitist education and elitist news and indeed elitist politics tends to make one feel. Are you worried, Adam, about the vaulting pace of technological change that Keith was describing? I'm worried about how it might be managed. And I think for this, actually, no country's model can be juxtaposed on top of another. And the countries with the most successful political and economic models will be the first to tell you that. But there is definitely something to China's model, because their model that was instigated by Dong Xiaoping, who you mentioned earlier, when he opened up and reformed the country in 1978, it allows the, the wealth of labor, whether it's produced by the fleshy hand or the mechanical hand to end up in the same place. If we can channel that wealth that the mechanical hand does, it can free up the fleshy hand to play the violin or write a book. Or That's obviously the ideal, the idyllic end of the spectrum. But the point is, if people can make the same amount of money by doing less work, which is theoretically possible under Dong's model that she is taking forward. It's possible it, that the technology and human development can both progress at an equal pace. Yeah. It's, it's, it's matching the vaulting pace of technology with the snail's pace of sociology. Absolutely right. Uh, I mean, China might be one thing, but there's not much sign of Britain and the United States agreeing to share wealth more equally. Well, you have to, for the Americans watching, you have to elect Andrew Yang. That's the main policy point of his campaign. Well, we, we'll come back to that, perhaps, jolly good. because I want to talk to you first about one of the uh, political figures now departed. Uh, Paddy Kurt Mack says, what's the political legacy of Ross Perot? Mm -hmm. And how does he fit in the American populist tradition of such figures as Huey Long, W.J. Bryan, Pat Buchanan, and the current tenant of the Oval Office, Donald Trump. Well, first of all, uh, may Ross Perot rest in peace. He was one of many great presidents that the United States never had, and in my view, should have had. Perot was in some ways like Trump. He was a, a categorical outsider. He was a businessman, albeit a bit more self-made than Trump, but you know who's clutching at those particular straws. Uh, but he was certainly a more fiscally responsible version of Trump. Trump is spending like a drunken sailor. So was Obama. So was Clinton, uh, so, was, so was Rankin going back that far. Well, there's been a lack of fiscal discipline in the US in spite of the rhetoric. But one thing that Perot and Buchanan and Long and Trump had in common is that they all thought that the working man needs to be safe and comfortable in his work. Ross Perot in 1992, when he was debating the incumbent George H.W. Bush and the young saxophonist and burger-eating champion Bill Clinton, it was innocent days. And this is before the name Lewinsky meant anything. Um, but he said, I can, when he was talking about NAFTA, which Donald Trump has capsized and replaced with um, a new agreement in North America, but Perot said two years before the agreement was ratified that I can hear a giant sucking sound of jobs leaving the country. People laughed at him. Well, I think Ross Perot, even, even beyond the grave, has had the last laugh there. So I can only say good things about Perot. That doesn't mean I agree with him on everything, posthumously as it were. But I think he had a lot of very good ideas. He was a deeply honest man. And unlike a lot of people, he, some people today actually go into politics knowing they'll lose. But that 
after losing, they can get a book deal or they can be on some celebrity thingy. With Perot, after he lost the 1996 election, which he also contested, he almost entirely faded out of the public eye of his own volition. He wasn't in it for the fame. He had a go and then he slipped back into his personal life. Is there any, uh, if you like, uh, any trailblazing in this? I mean, uh, did he uh, show that a third party candidate can actually get a lot of votes and can certainly decisively affect the outcome. Well, he was the most successful third party candidate in contemporary American history. And another thing he did in an age where there was no mother of all talk shows, there was no social media, there was only the newspapers, television and radio, which had only radio in America had only just come out of the crippling regulations it had been under in the last several decades. Perot was very clever. He realized that he didn't have the money in the organization organization to go barnstorming across a huge country, the United States. So he made these long television commercials, infomercials as they were known at the time, by today's standards of glitz and glam and post-MTV truth, if you can call it that. It was all very restrained. It was Perot at a desk with some uh, little, little charts going, no, you see here, the jobs are leaving the country because we have 5% there. Literally, that's what it was like with that distinctive voice. And there was just something that on the one hand, it's a big quaint because of how low tech it is. On the other hand, that's the Twitter live and the Facebook live and the alt media of that day. So even in that sense, he realized that you can touch more hearts by looking into a camera than you can shake hands by driving across all 50 states. Absolutely. Uh, if, uh, if Sanders is cheated again, might he run as a third party candidate? He himself will probably be a bit long in the tooth uh, four years from the year 2020. But I think that if the Democrats go forsake people like Yang, a sort of left populist like Saunders and others of that milieu, I think that you'll see a wake up call from the left and the right to say, maybe it's time to really go back to this third party thing. Because the populist genie is out of the bag. Whether it was Bernie's popularity in 2016, Trump's consistent popularity, amongst his populist base. The populism isn't going away. So whoever picks a sort of Theresa May uh, in a jacket or a, yeah. or a Hillary Clinton in a tie, they're not going to win. Here's a very hard one, Adam. Mm. So many religions throughout history share such similar stories and lore. For example, a virgin birth, 25th December, a star in the sky, uh, the guy dies for other people's sins, etc. Why is that? Asks uh, aspiring lockpick. Mm. Aspiring theologian, I should uh, think. Yeah, yeah. Well, th there's, a, there's a sort of anthropological answer, and then there's a metaphysical answer, the second being more interesting, so I'll try to rush through the first. A lot of religions, for example, that were new and that were overtaking in terms of popularity in older religion, they'd incorporate some of the dates of immovable feasts and some of the traditions of movable feasts to create a cultural continuity among people you're trying to convert. I mean, what easier way to convert people to a new faith than by telling them that which you are used to doesn't need you to be keep unlearned. Your current holidays. Yeah. Absolutely. So you don't need to learn anything new. And you also have religions that evolve from each other without wanting to take the other over. For example, many people have been misinformed to think that Jesus is not a prophet in Islam, which he very much is, as are all the prophets of the New and Old Testament. So religions can sometimes inspire other religions. Buddhism, for example, derives from a lot of the uh, polytheistic religions of India at the time. Now to the metaphysical answer. I'm not one to hang my hat on the idea of universal truths in the secular world, but when we talk about what defines us as beings, whether spiritual beings or philosophical beings or metaphysical beings, which sort of caters to both sides, there are certain things, do no harm, be charitable at least when you can, smile on your fellow man rather than take away from him. So you've got things like the golden rule of Christ, you've got things like zakat, charity, 
equality in Islam. The rich shall give to the poor, and if they become the poor, they shall get from the rich. Um, you see a lot of, th even in religions that didn't have contact with each other, you see similar themes. And that is because at an, at an instinctive level, the human condition requires peace. It requires bounty, and it requires conflict resolution mechanisms. And even though those three terms might sound a bit drab and secular, all of the great faiths of the world do ultimately aspire to those ideals. Let's take a quick break. Ask Adam. Hashtag. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us. From mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, and I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Hashtag Ask Adam, we'll turn to callers in a minute, but uh, Christina uh, says there's an article in the Telegraph, that's the Daily Telegraph, an English newspaper, formerly of note, uh, suggesting America is warning Britain against standing with China on Huawei, or else is Britain going to become the 51st state of America? I've actually lost track, uh, Adam, on this. The British were going to allow some Huawei involvement in 5G when Donald Trump was threatening uh, dire uh, repercussions for anyone who did. Then after the meeting between Trump and uh, G, it seemed that Huawei was back uh, in favor in the United States. What's the current state of the American-China relationship? Well, there was a great philosopher on an old, well not old, but a past its prime TV show called Little Britain by the name of Vicky Pollard, whose most famous line of equivocation was, but no, but yeah, but no, but yeah. For those who aren't familiar with the show, it's sort of, some would say, guttural level comedy, but a bit clever too, but not philosophy. <laughs> yeah, but no, but yeah, but no, but yeah. Indeed, and that, and that sort of, Trump seems to be vacillating because his own business community doesn't want the war with China. One big Trump card that the Chinese have in this new Cold War that the Russians didn't is that America's huge blue chip companies, the Nasdaq, all of these companies need China and they need it even more than they're letting on in public, where America and Russia don't have all that many private sector commercial transactions. So Trump doesn't want to crash his own stock market, but what he is doing is by delaying the trade deal, he knows that even if there's a rumor that a deal's about to be made just before the 2020 election, the stock market will go up from any position that it had previously previously been in. So he's playing a clever game that way. Uh, in terms of Britain, Britain has mastered this yeah but no uh, thing with Huawei because the actual people who know about technology and know about business know that you'd be mad to go with anyone else. It would be like someone saying, here's a Rolls Royce for 50 grand, but I can sell you a Volkswagen for 70. Uh, Huawei is the, the best 5G hardware at the most competitive price. Um, and so Britain is sort of 
doing a bit what the American private sector is doing and thinking, right, do we want to be big, bad, cold warriors or do we want to have phones that work? Yeah, well, we usually choose the, the former, uh, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Now, it may be at 9.33 in London, but it's 5 o'clock in the morning in Australia and we've got a call for you from there. Sean in uh, Australia. Welcome, Sean. Good morning to you. Good morning slash good evening, gentlemen. How are you doing? <laughs> good morning. Very well. The better for hearing from you. Go ahead. Hope you're both keeping well, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to put the, uh, to, to see what your opinion was, lads, on, on the. I, I think the the two party system as we know it in the UK in in Britain is is, is on its last legs. It's on life support, and uh, I, I I just wanted you, you to, a if you agree with that, and and b that. I, I can't see any way forward for the Labour Party other than uh, other than a split at the moment. I, I can't see any way forward, and and, and the only way uh, in terms of uh, I can see there being a bit of a um, uh, a pact between Farage and uh, Boris. I just well, we we, we definitely that. are in three-party uh, territory. Uh, all three of Labour, Conservative, and Brexit Party are all over twenty percent which would once have been regarded yeah. as a miserable uh, share yes. of the vote. But of course, when three people are sharing 20 plus, uh, then you can still be in government uh, and have less than 30 percent of the vote. You, admittedly, almost certainly a minority government. But the Liberal Democrats are not out of it either. Uh, and they've got the results of a new leadership election still to come. Although that might, is anyone paying attention? I'm not sure to anyone's it. paying much attention. But <laughs> you can see, no, uh, can't you? That's a donkey derby. Uh, oh, yeah, quite. yeah, and only two a two horse race, definitely. <laughs> um, Adam, we're in four party territory now, but Sean's on to something because uh, some of those four parties can make deals with each other because there's not actually that much difference between them. Uh, the Brexit Party and the Conservative Party, in theory, are committed to the same thing. Certainly if Boris Johnson becomes the leader. Uh, the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats uh, equally are committed to the same thing, which is wrecking Brexit and staying in the European Union. Well, here's some advice for Jeremy Corbyn, and I'm not sure why I'm giving it, but I am. If he came out as a strong Brexiteer and combined it with the other policies that he's been talking about for the last several years, he could probably form a majority government, not least because all the personal smears against him that you covered brilliantly in the first part of the show aren't really sticking. But in Labour's core constituencies, the place that they cannot form a majority government without, those places care far more about Brexit than about about the party loyalties that have been less and less meaningful 100%. ever since Tony Blair made a vote for Labour, the same thing as a vote for John Major, but with a, but with a bit more of a perky face, you know, that devilish Cheshire cat grin that we've all come to know and detest. It gets really interesting when one talks about the Brexit party and the Conservatives. Right now, Boris Johnson is saying that he wants to put Farage back into his box, not exactly coalition type of language, and Farage, for his part, is saying that he plans to challenge in every single constituency right across the country, and that he wants to finish off this untrustworthy Tory party. Now, it could be that Farage and Johnson are doing a bit what Trump and Kim Jong-un did in 2017. Insult each other, threaten each other with war. This planet's only big enough for the two of us. And who knows, the way the numbers are, if the Brexit party and the Conservatives made a pre-election pact uh, in the style that yep. I mentioned last Absolutely. year, a 1918 coupon style election, where Nigel Farage, as the kingmaker that everyone should objectively admit that he is, says, right, we're going to not stand against a ERG pro-Brexit style Tory in such and such southern constituencies, and if the Tories sit out elections in the north of England, in the Midlands and parts of Wales, we'll take on the pro-Remain Labour Party head on. Yep. It could also be a post-election pact, which could be less successful, because they would have taken percentages from each other during the election, but even so, they could just about form a workable majority 
majority coalition in that sense. Alternatively, a, a Remain Labour Party could form a Remain coalition with the Lib Dems and the, and the Greens and the Nationalists. I think that would be a disaster for Britain, a disaster for democracy, a disaster for the civil peace, dare I say, I hope it doesn't come to that, but dare I say indeed. So we have lots of possibilities, but I think those are the most realistic ones. Whether Sean, what do you think? Last word to you. I think that uh, the, I think that in the first past the post system, I think I think the Labour Party and in the world of pain and mm. the the uh, uh, leather patches on the elbow, soft shoe shuffle need to realise that without the North of England, the Labour Party simply cannot win power. Labour is ahead. Power. I mean, of the three parties that are over twenty, Labour is ahead. Uh, in most of the polls, not YouGov, which seems to be a wholly owned subsidiary uh, of, uh, of the government, but in, uh, in the, the majority of the polls, Labour is ahead. In one of the polls, uh, penultimate one, the one day before yesterday, uh, five points, I think, ahead. And that after, the the, is, after Panorama. The problem is, George, and, and obviously we're, 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 we're Labour people, but uh, in, inherently, but I, I think the elephant in the room in the f in the two in the first past the post system is that, that we, without the north they can't win, mate. They can't win. Quite yeah, right. I agree with that. Um, you see, the point is uh, the people making the decisions in the Labour Party about Brexit. I think we can agree it's not Jeremy Corbyn. Yes, I agree. Uh, the people who are making the decisions have calculated that by swinging to uh, a pro-Remain a second referendum, pro remain on the ballot paper, and Labour campaigning for remain, they've calculated that they can clean up the 48%, 49% of remainers in the country. But of course, they're competing with the Liberal Democrats and the Greens yeah. and the Nationalists, yeah. who are all remain parties. And my guess is that a lot of those kind of voters I'm not going to vote for someone with the politics, ideology, history, baggage <laughs> of Jeremy Corbyn. That's my take, 100%. Adam. Well, I totally agree with that, and I think that they're making a calculation that's so off, and it's because they're living in a bubble. The Tories are too, but then again, the Tory party is sort of a bubble at prayer, and the Labour party is sort of a bubble with everyone poking it with needles. The Brexit party, I have to say, actually has their ears, nose, feet, and all their other orifices to the ground. They know what's going on. The other thing I'll say with polls, unless you have five points plus of a percentage lead, and then assuming it's a correct poll, which a lot of these polls are a bit dodgy, but below that five-point lead threshold, it really comes down to a more interesting question of who is leading in what constituencies, of course. because of course America has the electoral college, parliamentary systems have constituencies, it's not one winner take in the country, that would be a referendum, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and we know Whatever all happens. about that. Whatever happens. <laughs> Quite uh, right. Thanks very much, Sean, in Australia. I think we've got another caller on the line, let's take it. Zachariah, Hello. welcome. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. George. Um, welcome. I, uh, yeah, so I call you. I, I would like to ask you a question, yeah, because, yeah, I heard a lot of things about uh, a Space Force. Uh, in first time, it was uh, from America. Uh, Mr. Trump and uh, his vice president was talking about uh, deploying a Space Force. And Two, day, two, two days ago, or three days ago, I hear the, the French president, yes. Mr. Macron, talking also about this, about deploying a space force. And I would like to ask you, yeah, is, is um, deploying a military, military force or military weapon in space forbidden? Because I think there is a law against it is uh, It is Zachariah forbidden, but that's not stopped. Can't think People, forbidden uh, on Earth instead. Talking, uh, about it. I would have thought, Adam, that uh, President Macron had rather more worldly things to worry about, uh, principally the 35 or 36 weeks of uh, mass insurrection across the country the revolt of the uh, working people of France. But 
he's got his eye on the stars. What's your view? Well, Napoleon was first exiled to Alba, and then he was exiled to St. Helena, so maybe Macron is sort of hedging his bets and checking out his options. Uh, they don't say the moon is made of cheese for nothing. And that <laughs> French cheese! <laughs> Indeed. French cheese in the moon. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's one of these typical arrogant things about Macron where anything Trump does, he tries to do better. So, uh, it's just, it's, it's this whole thing. I mean, it's a pity the French don't have a word for it, but I'm sure they do. But there's a sort of, there's sort of a fatalistic joie de vivre about Macron where he just wants his hands on every life-affirming experience, but he's not affirming the voters' lives. He's not affirming the people who took off Bastille Day. Happy Bastille Day to our French uh, friends. Ah, it um, is indeed, yes. Yeah, and in, and, in, Bastille Day. and in the tradition of Bastille Day, which wasn't a celebration, but the storming of a prison used for arms, the yellow vests were out in full force. If they've been for X amount of... I think of, 35 or 36 yeah. weeks. Zachariah, sorry about the hour. We have yeah. to press on. Thank you very much. Down with the Space Force, we say. <laughs> Take a break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us. From mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful uh, water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, and I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Call us tonight from Glasgow, from Denmark, the UAE, Nottinghamshire, London, Australia, Swindon, California, and New York City. And Adam, a couple of people have developed a crush on Adam. <laughs> uh, maybe we should start hashtag ask Adam out. <laughs> uh, so let's see how you do on that one. You're single, you're available. Patrick uh, says Adam is a 21st century philosopher. Amen to that. Uh, Milad Rohi says technology is dumbing people down. Exactly why the world is a mess. And Wild Goose 59 says time to make war on the machines. Where's my big hammer? Oh dear. Uh, we have the best brains, but smart computers would still likely eliminate us. Brackets, not Adam though. Uh, <laughs> we do want to avoid Luddism. Quite. But Luddism is a necessary consequence if uh, the division of the wealth created by new technology is not properly dealt with. I mean, if I'd been around at the time, I'd have been a Luddite. I would have been out with Ned Ludd uh, wrecking the machines because nobody made any arrangement for my family to eat when the machines got brought in in my place. And I think you make a very important argument that Luddism, in its proper sense when it began, it was a socio-economic and political reaction against the circumstance surrounding the machines rather than the machines themselves, even though ironically it was the machines that got the thrashing. Uh, today, Luddism has become almost a perverse political philosophy, and it's not old. It existed in post-independence India until Nehru tried his best to turn it around. It existed in post-war 
France in many ways, a resistance to modernity. And so there's two versions of this historical Luddism, which could easily repeat, as you're suggesting. And then there's the philosophy, the attitude of Luddism, which is just rather silly. But yeah. you're absolutely right. Be prepared to look after the workers in any circumstance, or they'll rebel in one way or another. Luddism is one of the options in those situations. Robert's in Virginia. Let's hear from him. Robert, go ahead. Hello, it's uh, nice to be able to talk to the both of you. Um, I have a question for Adam regarding the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Mm -hmm. Go on. And I'd like to preface this quickly by saying that even though the organization isn't necessarily old, in my opinion, it's constantly evolving and growing in both scope and size in the sense that its scope, it's constantly trying to um, busy itself in different matters and its membership is growing as well. So in your opinions, what are the main threats and hamperments currently facing the, the present incarnation of the SEO? Adam, one for you. I think false expectations by a world that's been conditioned by an American century, so-called, has led people to think that it's some sort of military alliance. It's certainly not that. It's a cooperative alliance where people, uh, well, partnership is the proper word, frankly, where people share intelligence, discuss common approaches to threats like terrorism, separatism, political, religious extremism, uh, things like that. And so most of all, it's a body of conflict resolution in the security realm and as it expands, as, as our colleague uh, correctly says, it's, um, it's also going into economic discussions on the sidelines. So even though there are other bodies that cover much of that same geographical area, Belt and Road being the obvious one, the SEO fora do give the countries involved an opportunity to discuss important matters of economic cooperation. And after all, you can't have peace without prosperity laying that foundation. Its biggest shortcoming probably, its inability to resolve the Kashmir question because every every nation on the borders of Kashmir is a member of the SCO but the SCO has a policy which is quite right not to get involved in individual disputes between members so whilst I agree with that it is a lost opportunity to once and for all bring a bit of justice and peace to Kashmir. Robert what part of Virginia are you in? Uh, I'm actually currently in California. I'm just uh -huh. using a phone with a Virginia number. Okay. But I am originally from Virginia. Okay. No, I'm just checking you're not from Langley. Um, <laughs> no, no, your, no. Uh, <laughs> what's, your, what's your take on what Adam had to say? Well, I think that was a very good and concise answer, and I completely agree with him on the uh, Kashmir issue. And uh, that was my very own opinion. I do see it as a lost opportunity, mm -hmm. almost uh, uh, a shooting itself in the foot, because... There was a great opportunity for the SCO to prove itself in practical terms as a body of resolution, but it just didn't seem to take the opportunity because it wishes to abide by its own rules. It's never going to go away, uh, the Kashmir question, until it is resolved. Robert, in California, but using a Virginia telephone, thanks very much uh, for that erudite uh, call. Uh, I hope we've got time for at least one more call. It's the legend. That is Norma in Bristol. Norma, welcome back. Hello, George. Oh, and um, very clear, too. Go ahead. Well, there's still an echo here, but never mind. I wanted to ask Adam about... Um, he likes all music, yeah. but uh, classical music, because I got an O-level in, in school in, in music, and I, I sort of enjoy all types of music, but many of the state schools... They don't teach this as a subject. And so many of the young people aren't interested. I mean, classical concerts in Bristol, uh, the average age of the people who go is about 70. And, uh, <laughs> and it's only the posh schools who do who teach it. And really, if you think of Verdi and Puccini and the operas, they're magnificent. And if you don't give these children an opportunity, then... Um, they miss out so much. Well, Norma, before I pass to uh, Adam, I, I don't know when they stopped it in the schools down here, but I was at school when they stopped it uh, in uh, Scotland, at least in my part of Scotland, because I was uh, a double bass player. I played in the uh, Dundee Schools Orchestra and the St. Cecilia Orchestra. I very much loved it, and I wanted to take up uh, the saxophone. 
mm. which I subsequently have uh, in later life. Uh, but mm. I wanted to do it at school, and they told me that we don't give free uh, music lessons, even after school, uh, anymore. Uh, so that's when I was at school, and that wasn't uh, yesterday. Uh, Adam, no, I know. What's your, uh, what's your take on Norma's overarching point? Well, the first point is, whichever one of us becomes Prime Minister first, we've got to appoint Norma as Secretary of Education, because yeah. I totally agree. <laughs> Investing in music, it's a fairly cheap investment. Playing kids' records, taking them to a concert, and the, most of the uh, venues and orchestras and the rest of it are very accommodating to school groups. It costs so little, and the potential rewards are so great. So that's point number one. Point number two, though, it's not only the lack of music education that scared people out of the concert halls. As a lover of orchestral music, I'm scared off of the concert halls because over the last 50 years there's been a gradual decline in some of the richest traditions of European classical music. I won't throw out some Italian music terms, it's slightly too early in the evening for that, but in the first half of the 20th century, as it did in much of the 19th century, maestros, conductors, were able to allow the tempi to flow in an emotional way rather than a metronomic, marching, stiff sort of way. Uh, there was much more expressiveness in the playing uh, of the individual sections, so the strings, the brass, the winds, and there were certain characteristics that separated the sound of one orchestra from another. It's all become too metronomic, it's all become too dynamically condensed, it's all become too internationally mundane. And so when orchestral concerts were really interesting, they were a more populist art form in the 19th century in Europe and in the 20th century in Europe and in many there parts of America. was music in the 19th century. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Wagner was such a populist that when uh, King Ludwig of Bavaria built him his own opera house, he insisted it doesn't have traditional box-like structures because he wanted it egalitarian for the masses. Today, you'd just be trying to get the bums on seats. Is what, what about uh, Norma's other point, that when she goes, as she does, uh, the average age is about 70? Why is that? Why are young people not uh, falling in love with classical music in the way that you and I did? I think, one, because they have no exposure to it at a young age, either through the family, through the school, or through the state-run media that is too busy smearing politicians rather than trying to provide some, some civilizational values to the society, if I can say that. And then the other reason is the quality of the music, while the precision of the playing has increased, the emotional authenticity vis-a-vis -vis even 45 years ago, I think has gone down. And young people want excitement. It's why in the 60s and 70s they were attracted to rock and roll, because that had the same joie de vivre, use that word twice, uh, that the orchestral performances of previous decades had. Young people want emotion in their music. And if you present classical music in the way it's presented today, as opposed to the way it was presented in the 19th and early 20th century, they'll be turned off. Last word to you, the legend that is Norma in Bristol. Well, I, I, I disagree a little bit. I think the conductors are very varied. And if you listen to something like Tosca, it's better than any orgasm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll probably have to bleep that out for the American audience. They don't like to talk about that kind of thing. Uh, um, Norma, that's a fantastic note uh, to bring our conversation uh, to an end. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. My apologies to all the callers and uh, all the tweeters that we never got around to. Uh, I don't know if there was a problem technologically uh, with, uh, with Skype messages, but we didn't get any through at uh, this end uh, anyway. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, it's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. And if it was, then I hope that you will come back next week with another viewer or listener, because we do need to build this show onwards and upwards. Adam. Thanks, as always, always for being pleasure. such a great sport, for being prepared to talk about anything and everything, <laughs> from the, uh, the, the metaphysical, uh, the existence of God and the prophets, to King Crimson, and uh, the uh, orchestral maneuvers uh, in the dark of uh, British uh, uh, politics. <laughs> there was uh, one uh, uh, ask, Adam, that I did want to put to you, though I will require it's answered in but uh, seconds. And it was uh, this. Uh, 
Yeah. Why didn't anyone in Parliament mention money creation? You and I are going to have to discuss this in a future uh, edition. The number of people interested in money, the theory of money, whether money is necessarily the god that it is portrayed to us as, whether money really does grow on trees, whether there is a magic money tree, all of these things I want to uh, hold your feet to the fire on in the course of the next few weeks. It's been marvellous. Good night. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us, from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful uh, water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com.